All right. We are going live here on Twitch. Get my little side monitor here set up so I can keep track of what's been going on here. All right. Let's see. Does this show me? Excellent. Okay. Make sure everything is good to go. Okay. It's kind of annoying. I wish I would see things like, oh, there we go. Okay, cool. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ross Shabilsky. I am the founder of D20 Studios. We are an indie game, video game development company based here in the beautiful Salt Lake City, Utah. And today we will be developing, this is episode nine of uh, our, my development stream so far. So over two months now, weekly streams, proud to say that. And uh, today we're having an exciting episode planned for you. Uh, this is gonna include developing some new cards, integrating to the game as usual. So if you're one of our pre-release players, you'll get some new content today. We're also gonna do a little bit of uh, some balance tweaks. And of course, the thing I'm most excited about, an exclusive first look at our single player development process. I know a lot of you have been dying to see our single player. And so I'm excited that uh, we've, we've, I've started work on that. I've got some preliminary systems set up. Looking forward to showing you guys that and getting your feedback because here at D20 Studios, I am a core believer in community-driven development and I take player feedback to heart to the utmost extreme and believe that with players and developers working together, we create something that is far greater um, than the sum of its parts. And so I am very appreciative to have everyone here in our community uh, joining us, supporting me in this uh, process, and I, I hope we have a lot of fun today. Hello, Maltros. Welcome to the stream. Glad to have you here with us. All right. So this morning, I think we'll start off with developing some new cards. Um, so I'm going to pull up uh, real quick. This is our website for anybody who may be new and coming for the first time, summersfate.com. We do have our pre-release publicly available now, and you can purchase that here on our website. It's awesome because it comes with all of the platforms that we're launching on. So if you're a mobile player, you can play on your phone, your iOS, your Windows, your Mac. And uh, just real quick, some of our key features of the game. I like to show this every time we do this. It's a top-down fantasy adventure deck builder game. And it's about winning in the most creative ways possible. So this is a game where my goal is that players are intrinsically motivated because they love the idea of creating really cool combinations of different things in their decks, um, whether it's throwing squirrels and mutating them into an army of Hulk squirrels, plopping a pile of skeletons on the boards and overrunning them, or executing devastating combos like you see over here. Um, all kinds of possibilities. Um, brings together the best elements of like RPG, exploration, tabletop gaming, all into one kind of nice, easily accessible experience. And that's what the game's about. All right, so I'm going to tune in now to our uh, daily updates. This is part of our forums. We like to keep in constant communication with our audience. So we do daily updates here on our forums that you guys can check out if you're interested in how dev is going any given time. Um, in today's episode, I said we're featuring on the single player. But before we get into that, we're going to look at some making in some new cards. All right, so... Um, real quick recap, last week we created uh, six new summoners, which are the game's main primary heroes that represent the player and are also the characters through which you cast all your spell cards. And so we created six last week, and we're going to go back and revisit those and maybe add a few more to the game for today's stream as kind of a kickoff, you know. So um, I'm going to click here to show you where we left off with some of the other ones. And if you guys are following too, this is all just... Um, the way you get here, I should probably show this so you can find it. Um, you go to our webpage, hit forums, go to game updates and news, and just click on this link here to go to our most recent daily updates, and it'll jump you right to where I'm looking at here. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to jump to our summoners page by clicking here. Maltross. New summoners are always exciting. Absolutely. 
All right, so this was our last week's episode page, and so I added all the kind of work in progress summoners here. And um, one that I was thinking about this morning as I was kind of reviewing my notes that would be really, I think, an easy win to get in the game, provide some immediate value and enjoyment, would be this Priestess character here. Uh, this is one of the characters that um, I think M. Zuccarella had also commented on, the idea of a, a void celestial summoner and that has kind of like some positive and negative effects that she can impose on the battlefield. So I think we'll start today with creating the Priestess. And if you guys have other ones you want me to take a look at, just uh, shout them out here in the channel and uh, we'll try, I'll try my best to get to them. All right, so to do this, we're going to use our um, in-house tool um, that I call the, lovingly call the D20 Definitions Editor app. All right, and this is what it looks like. Um, this is a full suite of developing content for the game. It actually can run the game in it as a separate module, which I've kind of got here just playing around and testing things and such. Um, and we're going to use this today to make that new character. So I'm going to go back and these definitions store all the various content that I create within the game. And in the units table here, we're going to find the priestess and then go ahead and start creating her. So here is priestess. All right, and we can look up and look down, and we can show her card here. All right, now, right now, her abilities are all just sort of uh, stubbed in. I've got this little description here where I can kind of just type anything I want. So, hello world, and you'll see that this appears in here. Um, these other areas down here are the actual abilities that are programmed in. So I did go ahead and get some things set up, like her power, stats, her life, um, the fact that she can also use void magic and uh, and her summoner status. Um, but what we want to do today is give her a few powers. Um, far shot is an ability that allows a character to um, use a special um, effect on enemies at range. So normally she's a melee character and she does two, two damage to a character in melee. But if she's going to target um, somebody who's far away, then what will happen is that she will um, use this other ability instead. And then support is used when she targets an ally. And in this case, she's going to heal and remove debuffs. OK, so um, let's start off with the easy one, uh, the support. This one's easy, I, I should say, because I've already got some characters that have these existing abilities. And so we're going to repurpose those with a little bit of tuning. So um, specifically, the character I'm thinking of that has this power is our cleric. OK, so this is a guardian character who can join your party as a supporting character at the start of the game. Or in our single player, eventually you'll be able to recruit and gather guardians to join you on your adventures. Um, and so she's already got the power for um, remove debuffs and heal. All right, so she's using two separate abilities to do this, um, the remove debuffs power, which is already programmed in, and the heal power. So what we're going to do is basically recycle these powers for the um, the priestess so she that, that she has them as well so she'll be the only summoner in our group that has the power to natively heal other characters which is pretty pretty awesome power all right so support we've got heal okay and i'm gonna get rid of this uh block here so that we don't confuse ourselves okay so and right now you'll notice it says support heal one okay so what we want to do is tune this value here and we said we wanted to do four so she's not quite as good as the cleric but four is still really good and we're going to bump that up and then the other power we're going to give her is our support uh where is it support for um remove debuffs there we go okay and i'm trying to think if there's any better way i should put that support remove debuffs heal four okay that looks a little better with the lineage. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and hit save here to give her those abilities. All right. So now we need to program this far shot, give minus one, minus one as another power. So we have to create that because I don't currently have that ability in our list of abilities yet. So we're going to create one by going into the status effects. Hello. Man, I'm having a hard time reading that name. It's Scribe from Hero Mages. Welcome. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I might have my font set a little too small here. I uh, I had I had been having trouble um, following along with the chat because I, I stream on one monitor. I'm just using my laptop here that I work on, and I had a hard time with uh, being able to view the chats um, looking at the second monitor. So I, I finally found a solution that would let me get the chat streaming on my regular monitor here, so I could communicate a little better on the streams. Welcome. So glad to have you with us. All right, so um, where was I at here? We are going to, we are in the process of creating a new summoner. It's the priestess, and we are currently in the process of giving her a new ability. So what I want to do here is uh, I'm going to try and find an existing one I can kind of use as a as a stub for this. Um, trying to think, we got range, psychic blast, knockback, immobilize. I'm trying to think if there's anything. This one's maybe kind of like what we want to do because we will be applying a status effect. Let's go ahead and copy this effect and we're going to call this range and then we're going to say um, minus one, minus one, I guess. I mean, technically it doesn't have to be minus one, minus one. It could be, I'm going to do the, my other special keyword here, which is called minus amp, minus amp. I like to make powers as flexible as possible so that we can um, interchange them with other characters. All right, and then um, we're going to say give, um, how did I do this again? Minus amp, minus amp. So this amp keyword here is um, a special keyword that my code will then go and replace with the actual values that we pass in so that the text on the card always reflects the, the true value which is great if I decide later we want to tune it down or tune it up. We don't have to worry about the text being inconsistent ever with the ability. Okay, so we have got this power in place. And uh, now I'm going to change this. So this was, it looks like this effect used to be giving a mobilize. I'm going to change this now to our debuff power, which will be here as minus amp minus amp. Okay, and we want to put in one so that it will use the multiplayer when it's passed in. And then um, remove this, uh, let's see. And then uh, this, I also wanna make another condition. This says target subject, target, um, what's the other thing I want? Traits, and we want traits um, type unit is greater than or equal to one. Cause it doesn't really make sense to cast this curse onto non-living or I guess placeable objects, number one. Okay, so anybody who's visible, not on my team, and is a unit can have this effect. Um, and then this power here allows her to um, use it as a counterattack. So if she's hit from far away at range, she can also apply her curse that way as well. Okay, so I'm going to hit save on this. And then the other thing I want to do is um, apply the appropriate sound effect for this and also some VFX so that we can kind of see a little visual indicator of what's happened. And for that, I want to go ahead and grab, uh, let's see, the one I'm thinking of is that poison effect. Uh, I'm going to go and find it. Go to my poison spell effects here. Yeah, here we go. This is what I want these little effects here. I'm just going to copy this down. Okay, and I'm going to put this in here. This is my other notes for today. This is already the, uh, the things we're going to do. So that's the cast sound effect, and then I want to have this animation here. Good. And now let's go back and put those effects in there as well. Range, debuff. Here we go. Okay, so we wanted this one. And I also wanted this guy as the cast. Okay, and I believe that's all we need. So let's hit save. Now we're gonna go back into the priestess character and give her her last power. Then we're gonna test her out, make sure she's working. So P for priestess. Okay, and we're gonna go into here and give her a new power, which was our ranged ability. And that was this guy here. All right, and it should be by default be minus one, minus one. Now we do need to get rid of this old text here. There we go. I really wish that it didn't line up like that. It's kind of awkward. Some of these things are here for convenience so that it automatically puts the text in there, but in some cases it's breaking the lines a little bit weird. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to 
fix that other than maybe we could say like give enemy minus one minus one so it looks a little bit more readable let's try changing it that way eventually I'll have to create some ways to tune this a little better so that that text lines up a little nicer and more clean um, because this looks a little strange with that minus going over there okay so let's go back to that ranged ability again and just for now I'm gonna change that to be something that will force to go to the second line all right so we want range that was this one here and I guess I'll have to be capital give enemy okay now let's see if that looks any better on the priestess card the real fun is going to be when I get to the point of localizing it so obviously we want to have this game be a worldwide sensation and so at some point in the future this will all get localized yeah I still don't quite like how this lays out the card but um, again our, our focus right now is really on functionality so I'll get I'll figure out a way to clean up this text at a later point in the future uh, but for now that looks a little better so we're gonna go ahead and test her out and see how this card uh, works oh the other key thing I need to remember to do is to give her functional status this will make it so that uh, she was previously disabled inside the game now she will be enabled as a player selectable choice okay so let's go try out the priestess and for that we're gonna go to our maps and we're gonna go to uh, let's go to the dungeon here and test and let's select her as our main character priestess And she'll need a name at some point. So if anybody's got a good idea for a name, feel free to shout that out because uh, all the other summoners have given names too, I think so. Oh, yeah, the game just sort of ended there because I have no enemies. Let's uh, let's put some enemies in there. Let's throw in a, uh, let's throw in the fighter mage and, uh, and a cheery and uh, an acolyte. <laughs> Why not? All A's, triple A. Okay, so this is just a really cool, quick way of testing the game. I've just launched up a, a level here, and now we can test her power. So right off the bat, we can see there's a clear problem. Uh, she can't seem to, she doesn't target anybody. That's a problem. So her ranged ability is not working. Also, we need to make sure we've got another ally in here. So let's give her an ally, an angel warrior, so we can test her support ability. So we got a lot of things to check out here. So let's see if she can at least heal an ally. Right now she can't because that ally has no affliction, so if we wound her, there we go, okay. So healing worked, that's good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and also put this debuff on on the other enemy summoner, which, which deck we're using, your transfer test. So we're going to give the enemy some cards. There we go, and then I'm going to put on test options, show AI cards, and then we'll also say show full deck, just so I've got, oh, not that one. Show AI a full deck. Okay, let's start this over. So now I've got access to the enemy spells, and we're going to try another idea, which is to see if she can cure the debuffs. Okay, so now the angel is afflicted with debuffs, and we're going to attempt to cure that. And that worked. The poison went away, so good. So her support ability is working, but her ranged ability is not. I'm not quite sure why that's the case. Um, we're going to go back and look at that ability and make sure we programmed it correctly. So let's go back and I'm going to go to that status effects again and we're going to go to the range um, minus amp minus amp. Okay, so yeah, this is interesting. Um, huh. I am, I am intrigued as to why this is happening. So let's see here. We have it set as a range context. The team is not equal to ability user's team. The target type unit is greater than or equal to one. Those all seem like they're valid choices. So I wonder why this didn't work. Oh, we have a range set inside of here. We don't want that. Let's change that to zero. That's what the problem was. There should be no range on this ability. So let's hit save. Okay. And hit back and maps. Let's go test this again. We'll go back to procedural two. And let's test once more. 
There we go. That's what I wanted to see. So now we can now we can see that all the enemies are lighting up as targets for the range. So the way far shot in the game works is uh, when a character has far shot, they can either move as usual, they can melee attack if they're already standing next to an enemy, or they can. Oh, we've got a suggestion here from Scribe. You may want to reduce the game's volume versus your voice. Okay, yeah, that's a good call. Um, I can do that here. Sound effects. Wow, they're not that. It's not that loud, but all right. Let's try ratcheting down to ten. Um, let me know if that sounds better for you. How's that? Me talking while clicking things. Am I a little bit clearer now? Yeah, I may. I um, realized uh, I, I had been streaming all this time, and I had been using the internal system microphone. So it probably balances a little bit differently than this microphone here. Um, but this microphone and the headset obviously gets rid of all the hums that you were hearing before. Better. Okay, excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Hey, Primary Feather, welcome. <laughs> So glad to have you on the stream. Yeah, so I got to introduce this guy. He is uh, the Primary Feather, um, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just going to embarrass you a bit, but th that's Daniel Spurl. He's the creator of Starling. Um, this guy is just a genius. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had the honor of meeting him back in, I, I want to say it was 2012 at the Adobe Max conference. And he has created this engine that uh, originally started for iOS and then he took and coded it all to work for ActionScript. So what's amazing about it is it's a really intuitive, easy to work with, um, display um, driven um, engine that's very intuitive. And then it leverages the GPU to render everything super, um, super performant. So the way, the reason that um, our game is able to run the way it does is because of uh, Daniel's amazing engine. Uh, and I've talked about this before, but since he's here, I'll, I'll show it again. We've got this little character in the game, that this guy. Oh, actually, no, that's not the guy. Uh, it's the other one, this guy. Yeah, this is the little red starling. Uh, and Daniel, just so you know, the starling has been <laughs> quite the popular character in the game. I, I think I have it in at least five of my, my 18 decks. <laughs> because it's su such an awesome character. It gives all your allies a plus one, plus one boost. And it it's uh, it also can now work with the other animal cards. So now you can breed the birds, you can mutate them. It's pretty fun. Um, so this is the logo for Starling. Um, but I put that in there because Daniel has been just an amazing supporter. He's uh, gone above and beyond uh, the level of service I've ever seen with anybody that creates software or tools. Um, something that's very rare in the, in today's industry that um, I, I like to strive for as well. Um, just providing that extra level of, of customer support. I mean, yeah, the guy is awesome. If you have never, if you're a game developer looking to work with a new engine, I, I highly recommend uh, the Starling framework because it is just awesome. And I could not imagine a better uh, developer slash support person than Daniel. So yeah, that is the Starling. All right, so um, let's see, where was I at now? We, we were just in the process of finishing the test with the priestess, and I think that we had determined her powers were all working. Uh, yeah, so minus one, minus one, that worked correctly. Good. Um, yeah, her powers can be pretty cool because uh, it's actually a permanent debuff. Unless you've got something that can cure debuffs on your team, it can be quite nasty. So she should be an interesting character. Um, it's kind of like a good combination of like the light and dark side of things is, is what, what the theme was for her. And I'd always wanted to put a priestess in ever since Hero Mages because um, a lot of players had wanted to see a, um, I guess we called it recovery magic at the time, base summoner to kind of balance out the other four we had initially had in the first game. So she's all set to go and I will now have her in the roster when we do our DLC update today, she'll be available for you guys to play with. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed, Daniel. You, 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 every word I say is just, I, I mean, I can't thank you enough for all the support you provided and everything you've done for me in helping the game. It, it, incidentally, I should say also that uh, Daniel is great. I'll come to him with these different challenges. We've had all kinds of cool things in the game we've done, like uh, the God Ray effects and uh, other special VFX in the game. And he, he'll come back and he likes a challenge. So when you throw something like that, then he'll come back and add an entire extension to Starling. So I think at least like three different Starling extensions have been added to the game with these cool VFX, like the 
uh, splash effect and the god rays and and all kinds of other cool things i mean it's just 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 an amazing dude um just love that he's so willing to help support and create things and and also make his engine better as a result of working with developers that's just an amazing collaboration so kudos again man um all right so we've got this pre the priestess done check that one off the list we're gonna go back to our drawing board here and so now we have got a uh, uh, our list of our roster of summoners. Like I said, we've already created some of these. I, I probably should have checked up the ones we've done. Um, but uh, Priestess is done. Um, we could maybe attempt to do the Wizard or or Nova today. Um, I think I've got enough um, stuff in the engine to support those two. Uh, we could also do something with the Warlock if you guys got ideas for what his other power could be. Uh, I could certainly add him to the game today as well. So any thoughts on which one of these characters we'd like to attempt? Of those ones I picked out, uh, Nova, Warlock. Oh, we could try the Battle Mage too. That that's another one that could be fun. So, yeah, let's maybe do one more Summoner, and then we'll do uh, some of the balance changes I had planned, and then I'll, I'm going to show off the single player stuff. So take your pick. Which new card do you guys want? Oh, Wizard was the other one. Wizard. Probably one of the biggest motivator factors is you want to think about what combination of these cards. These little symbols at the top, this is just placeholder art for now, but these represent the card border art that you'll be able to, um, which which spells the caster can play when you, when you build your team. So Wizard can use Chaos and Arcane. She can use Chaos and Celestial. Warlock can use Void and Chaos. And Wizard looks great. All right, fantastic. Let's go. Let's do the wizard. I like it. I like it. Good call. All right. So, wizard, wizard. Let's go back. All right. So this is our units tool, and this may be new. I don't know if uh, if Daniel's seen this thing yet. So I'm, I'm excited to show this off. This is the um, this is the definitions editor tool set that I use to build all the game's content, and I've got all of the characters programmed in here. And I'm trying to think what why was oh he's Rainman the wizard. That's right. I do need to add like a better way to search through these because having just one list and not having the search bar makes it hard to find things now. Um, so this is cool. Um, this this tool, Character Builder, is what we use to actually build all the characters and assemble the animations. So you can preview all the animations in here. Um, all the character animations in this game are built with Dragon Bones, which is a 2D based uh, sprite, uh, not sorry, sprite, um, 2D based armature tool. So uh, imagine if you were to create these characters like you would in 3D space, but in 2D space, um, they've got little pieces like the arms, the head, that are all interchangeable. So rather than a traditional render that would have these all act as full sprite animations, these are done um, very lightweight on the texture atlas. Like um, you can fit the entire game's worth of characters on a single atlas and all the animations are just JSON objects that do tweens and stuff to move the parts around so it's it's very very performant very conservative of, of system resources and things really um nerdy and awesome if you're a developer and, and like this kind of stuff so um one of the one of the features i did with the module though was build in the ability to um, import the full animations list which is great so if i want to test out different animations with different characters we can play them all in this character yeah that's pretty fun <laughs> um, you can also use this tool to equip all of his different gears and stuff. So if you want to give him like a wizard hat, you can, what was the one I thought looked good on him? Was the menacing wizard hat? Yeah. Now he's got a hat. See, isn't that fun? <laughs> wizard. All right. And uh, this also has, us let's program the sound effects and things like that too. I've got all those different things in here. The scale. And then it, it's got some really advanced features as well. I think I showed off last week with our bug. We, we can actually hybrid together different armature types to create like hybrid mutants that are part humanoid, part, uh, part bug and part animal and things like that. Okay, so just a quick summary of kind of what this game thing can do. And then of course, uh, all the card previewing can be done here as well. All right, so wizard is probably one of the um, most powerful um, but also most difficult and confusing characters to play as. His power doesn't seem all that great. He um, is going to draw a card whenever you cast and once per turn discard it. 
So what what that really means from a design standpoint um, for a player using him is that this character is all about controlling the random. Um, when you have a game that uses cards, you know, you're shuffling the deck, you're going to have random draws. You don't know necessarily what cards you're going to pick up. The wizard is awesome because his power will allow you to cycle through that in a very controlled and methodical way. So the key with using the wizard is to build decks that maximize his ability so that you can basically control the battlefield um, better than your opponent. And that's how he, he wins the game. Really a, really, really a great character if you like, if you like control and messing with people's minds. Um, all right, so we need to create a power that says uh, draw a card whenever you cast and then once per turn discarding. So he's going to need to have some triggers added to him to do these different things. Um, so I think both of these abilities here are the result of triggers. So we're going we're gonna to now show off our triggered ability editor. Um, so the triggered ability editor is, is how we create. Um, this actually lets us create game logic that will then have effects within the game. All right, and I'm going to try and find an existing power here I've got. Um, the wizard is similar to the archmage who has a similar power with the draw. So I'm going to try and find his, uh, yeah, he's got one that's draw a card on cast arcane. Okay, so I just got to refresh again. So draw a card whenever you cast. Whenever you cast, he draws a card. Okay. All right, so I'm going to copy this ability here that says draw a card on cast arcane just because it's got the triggers I want set up already. Okay. So we're going to call this ability draw card on cast. Okay, so I'm going to review really quickly what we're doing here. Um, so we're going to define this as a trigger event. So we're basically going to say whenever this trigger in the game happens, we're going to do something. The trigger we're going to use is the preemptive, which basically is what hap fires right as you're about to cast something. And um, the cast event will pass this information. The activator is the caster. These are the targets of the spell all kinds of different things. And these all change based off of how you pick the events. See, I've got this little cheat sheet because I have a hard time remembering what these things all do. Um, but that's how I can connect the game logic back to um, the different effects. Anyway, so this is gonna be preemptive. And then the targeting method defines how we're gonna target this particular action to do something. Um, and since this is a draw card action, we're probably gonna create a manual one, which we'll do down here. All right, so now let's look at the conditions uh, because right now this event will fire whenever anything is cast, which would include spells, abilities, your opponent's things, anything. And we don't want to include all that. We want to filter it down to just when this caster uh, uses a card. So um, the key things we got to do here, um, event activator um, is the caster, right? So we want to say the caster's player ID is equal to the ability user's player ID. So we want to make sure, first off, that this is our caster. That's what this block of logic is saying. And then the second thing we want to check is to make sure that the action being cast is a spell. Um, actions are spells when they're played via a card. So that makes sure that this will only work when you're we're casting a card and not just using any other ability. Um, and then this trigger here says that the card has to be an arcane. Now, that was a restriction of the Archmage, but the wizard is going to use that power on any card. So we're going to remove this trigger. Or this condition. All right, so now this power will follow the logic we have written here, which says draw a card whenever you cast. So what we just did was we wrote the part that says whenever you cast um, is what we've done so far. And now we have to have it draw a card. Okay, so um, this is pretty simple. We don't need these other things here. All we're going to need in this case is the draw a card, since he's not going to do any special cost discounts to the card like the Archmage does. Okay. So draw a card on target, and um, the way we're determining the target in this case is that we want any player that equals the ability user's player ID. Um, since the player is the one who uses the draw a card action, um, we just cast it like that. And that should make it so he draws a card when he casts. So let's save that, draw a card on cast, and um, let's go ahead and put that on him, and then we'll test that part first to make sure it's working. Wizard. Wizard. Oh, I keep forgetting his name's Raymond the Wizard. That's going to drive me nuts. All right. Wizard. All right. So um, let's for now take off this description so that we can put in our... Oh, you know what I totally forgot to do with that last thing was put that description inside the... Uh... You know what? Let's keep his description here. I think it might be better to have his description read simpler than versus having it inherit from the triggered ability. Um, but let's give him that ability that says draw a card on cast. Uh... Draw a card on cast. Okay. Okay, so there it is. 
All right, now we're going to go ahead and test them and make sure that it actually does that. So I'm going to go back to our little test tester here. And uh, let's pick a different level this time. We'll pick procedural three. What's this guy? That's a hallway. Okay. And we're going to pick Rainman the Wizard. And I'm going to pick a deck that's got more cards in it. So we'll pick the, uh, let's pick the Mind Gamer deck. And we'll start this up. Here we go. So now we're firing up the game inside of our engine here, which is just awesome. All right, so he should draw a card whenever he casts. So here's a great one that works great with the wizard, Mana Surge. So give me some extra mana. And there I drew a card. Such beautiful dungeons. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been a big work in progress, getting this art style honed to this level where you've kind of got that nice top down and a little bit of perspective on the walls. Kind of reminds me of the old... Uh, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. That was definitely an inspiration for the for the game's dungeon arts. All right, so he did draw a card, which was cool. And w one of the great things about him being arcane is there's a lot of cards in the arcane set that do things like boost mana or give other effects. So a card like Mana Surge is actually a great choice for a wizard because he can get some extra energy and then cast another card. All right, he drew another card. That's cool. So that power is working so far. All right, so then the other power we need to do is to give him the power to draw cards when you discard. So in the game right now, um, I have to turn off my cheats to discard. Test options, turn off that. All right, so now I can discard cards. So we want to make it so that he can also draw a card when he discards, which will give him a huge advantage. Um, we've got some really advanced players in our community that have figured out that the discard actually gives you a, a great advantage because... Um, Whenever you can't cast something, you can kind of get rid of your hand. And then the regular game rules allow you to draw back to three at the end of your turn. So it's a great way to get um, extra cards. But what makes the wizard so cool is that he'll be able to, if he finds himself in a situation where he can't do anything effective, he can just get rid of a card and draw an immediate one that same turn, which may be the card that helps him out. Right? All right, so what we need to do is now create a, a trigger for the discard so that he draws one on discard as well. Okay, I sure hope I have a discard trigger. I don't know if I do or not. <laughs> um, I should have a discard trigger. Of course I do. Yes, we've got discard triggers right here. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to copy one of these uh, these triggers. Oh, you know, I, I just occurred to me another issue we had with that last thing was I have to go back and and change that draw card so we can't so we don't exploit it. I'll explain in a second what, what I mean by that. But for right now, let's get this working. Um, I'm going to copy this existing trigger here for the discard, draw, train card. And this one's going to just be to discard, draw a card. Okay. And I'm going to delete that. Okay. All right. So what we've got here is the trigger event is discard. So this is a card event. Um, and then we want it so that the event target equals ability source. I'm trying to figure, figure out what that means. Ability source is the unit or status of the trigger action. Okay. So this will be the unit containing that ability. All right. And then what we want to do here is just draw a card. We don't want this to be tree We want this to be draw a card. Draw a card. And we want to draw one card when you discard. Okay, and this is just targeting ability user. I guess that also works. We can target ability user to do the draw card because it'll default to player for ability user. Okay, and we want to get rid of this. Oh man, I forgot about that. I don't have a way to clear this thing. I need to clear that. We'll have to go into the actual database. Ross forgot to put a button here that gets rid of that. <laughs> yeah, I got to clear that. All right, so this is ID 427. I'll have to do a manual edit here in just a second. But let's start off by saving that. And then I'm going to close this, and we're going to go and edit that really quick. Definitions Azure. Uh, here we go. So the great thing about this is being a SQLite database, I can go in here and manually edit things, which is fun. Triggered abilities, and then that was discard draw a card yeah that's what we need to do i'm going to get rid of that spell i highlight this row there we go um where did that guy go spell yeah get rid of this okay apply we don't want that in there because that that 
setting that flag has different, um, do you want to save the changes you made? Yes. Okay. I'll go back in there. All right. So now we're going to go back into the uh, units. We're going back to wizard and we're going to give him his new power. Oh, it's again R. I keep forgetting his name. Rainman the wizard. Yeah, he's actually a character from Hero Mages. He's in the Hero Mages lore. So if you're familiar with Hero Mages, he's, he was one of the very popular characters in that game. One of the four summoners we had for Hero Mages. All right, so his other power we just created for him is discard, draw a card. All right. There we go. And save. And now we're going to go back to that map and test this out. Make sure he can discard and draw. Okay. All right, so I don't, I don't want this Minotaur. Let's get rid of him. Discard. Oh, he didn't draw a card. That was kind of a bummer. I was hoping that was going to work. All right. Um, interesting. I think I understand why that's happening. That trigger ability was designed to work with the uh, a different way. I'll explain. So when we created that ability, we used the discard draw a treant card now i've got some of the cards and summoners fader designed so that they're contextual like um the treant card turns a tree into a monster but if there are no trees the card can't be used so we have these alternate abilities called discard powers that allow you to do other things um, the reason that power didn't work just now is because this trigger is set up to act on a card itself not on the person who has the ability so we need to change those trigger conditions um, in this case here, um, we want to make it so that um, rather than being event target equals ability user, um, we want to make it um, event target. Uh, let's see how we want to do this. Event activator. Yeah. So the event activator is the player that drew or discarded the card. We want to make it so that the event target, the player that drew the card is equal to the ability user um property player id that's how we're gonna do this okay so trigger subject property player id okay and see this is why this is why logic here is so important because um the way you word conditions has very different meanings for how the game will interpret it um, but in this case we want it so that anytime we discard any card not a specific card um, that is this, that is from the player who also owns the wizard that it's going to use this power. And before it was just tied to a specific card, which was not going to work for us. So this should fix that problem. Let's go back and retest. All right. Procedural two and testing here and boom. Okay. Now let's try again. Let's get rid of this guy. And he drew a card, as you saw there, which is great. Okay, we can't discard whenever we can cast a card, so if I teleport here, now these cards, I have no mana left, I can start discarding. Now, this is where I thought his power might be a little too strong if there's no cap on it, because I can literally, this is ultimate control. I can go through my entire deck and find a very specific card I want. Like, now I've got the mana surge. And now I've got another mana surge. And now I can start casting things again. So you can see how this could be maybe a little bit overpowered without any kind of capping on that whatsoever. So that's why I thought maybe his power should be constrained to just once per turn drawing on discard, because otherwise it's uncapped. Um, would you guys agree, Who's who, everyone viewing here? Maltras, I'm fine with that. Okay, fine with which one? <laughs> Infinite draws or, or capping his power to once per turn with a discard? I should probably be more clear. All in favor of capping it to once per turn, say I. <laughs> okay, while you guys are deciding that, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fix another issue. Um, so this this was something that was an interesting thing that came up with regards to the Archmage, um, who also has a similar power of drawing cards on casting spells, and that problem was that um, it gave players a way to kind of see the future which normally is not a big deal, but in our game, we've got this take back button here that lets you undo moves. And so um, 
particularly since we don't have turn timers yet, this was causing situations where players could look ahead to see all the things that were going to happen in their deck, which um, in many cases felt a little bit overpowered and uh, unfair, and it also slowed the game down quite a bit. So one of the new features I added to the game was the ability to draw the cards um, face down so that you couldn't see them. That way the power could still work, you could still undo your actions, but once you reveal the cards, it would prevent the undo from working to kind of limit that ability to sort of cheat a little bit. Maltra says, I wish it was like you can choose to discard more than one at a time to redraw that many. Oh, yeah, that could be interesting. Um, that's a little bit more, probably trickier than I have the ability to do today on the stream because I'd have to maybe change how the UI works. But uh, yeah, I could see what you're saying there. Like having a button that could like let you discard your entire hand or something like that could be kind of cool. Yeah, that would be an interesting way to handle it for sure. Um, I'll keep that idea on the back burner and maybe we can revisit that. It's going to need some additional UI control so to, to make that work. All right. Um, the other thing we could do is we could certainly limit it to um, discarding three per turn could also work. Um, and we could even get really fancy. I, actually, I, I, there is a way I could do it, Maltras. I could have it so that you could discard until you reveal a card, and then you could effectively discard your entire hand. Sorry to break stuff. Oh, no worries. That's why we're all here, to break stuff. It's the only way to make things better. Break to make it better, right? Um, okay, so so we need to make it so that we cloak these cards so you can't just see what they are without um, immediately viewing them. And to that end, I've got uh, a really easy way to do that. Um, I'm trying to remember how I did that. It was, uh, which card had that? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Revealing light is the one I want. So what I need to do is, yeah, I had to set this trait to draw face down. That's what I need to put down there. So let's go back to our triggered ability. Let's go back to our draw discard draw a card and I want to add that trait that says draw face down one and I want to do the same thing for the draw card on cast okay and we're going to make this also say trait draw face down okay let's go back and test that now and this should make it so that we can't see the cards until we click on them too bad that he can't use that revealing light spell oh yeah that is too bad but the archmage can so the Archmage is a combination of Arcane and Celestial, and he's also similar to the Wizard, just a little bit different. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this out. There we go. Okay, so now I can't see the card. And see, the advantage of that is that um, I can still undo, right? But I'm not cheating to know which the next card is. Um, once I reveal the card, you kind of hear that little sound effect of surprise is triggered, and you'll see now that um, the undo button is turn into a replay button. So now I can't undo past this move here, which is good, so that I can't, can't cheat. But I still get the power. Um, let's also make sure that it works the same for his casting. And that also drew, drew the card face down. So I can still undo that. If I made a mistake, I'm, I want to cast on this guy. But uh, once I reveal, now I can't undo past that. Okay, so that's fixed. All right, so the last thing we need to do get, to get the wizard working is just to limit his discard power to once per turn so that we can't just keep drawing cards over and over again. Um, so what we have to do is set some flags for that to make it so that um, it, it, we can keep track of how many cards he has, um, how, how many times he's used that ability. Right. Okay. So, um, do, 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 and then draw a card whenever you cast and... Yep, okay, so let's go back and let's add some properties here. So we're gonna create a new flag. Um, it's gonna be called um, new flag, and we're gonna say um, this flag will be um, drew on discard maybe, drew on discard. Yep, and we're gonna hit save. And then we're gonna go to our triggered abilities we're going to go to our card power we just made, which was the discard draw card. Here it is. And um, in addition to the effect of draw card, we're going to add a new action effect that says set attribute. Uh, maybe what we're going to do is we're going to increment the attributes. probably the best way to do it. 
add to attribute. Um, and we want subtype, we want this to be add to trait, sorry. Subtype will be flag. Um, and the power we just created was called draw and discard one. Okay. So what this is going to do is basically add, and we want the target of this to be a bill user. That sounds good. Okay. So this is basically saying that when we use this power, we're going to increment a flag to say we've used this power. Okay. And then what we want to do is add a new condition that says target subject. Uh, let's see, trigger subject. The ability user, traits, and we want flag draw on discard is less than or equal to number zero. Okay, so he will only be able to trigger this power if this number is less than zero. And since we increment it by one, that will prevent him from using it more than once per turn. Let's go and check that out. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to have to cast something to get rid of this, okay? And now I can discard, so I'm going to discard. I drew a new card, and I'm going to get rid of another card. Oh, I did not draw a card. Uh-huh, see that? So that worked correctly. Um, however, the problem is that we have done nothing to, not, to reset the flag. So if I end my turn, and the computer goes, and we're going to skip this turn, um, I'm going to attempt to discard again. Uh, let's get rid of... I can't, I have to cast something first. Let's cast him. Okay, let's discard this. Notice that it did not reset the ability. So we need to add another trigger that says, at the start of my turn, reset that back to zero. And then the wizard should be fully functional. So let's go ahead and create that ability now. So what we want to do is, um, I'm trying to think if I've got other things that have start a turn. Let's just make a whole new ability. Let's go, um, Discard, draw, reset on start turn. So the event here we want is trigger event. We want this to happen on start turn. And we want this to just um, target the ability user. Okay, so the first thing we want to make sure is that trigger subject, um, the activator, the player that started turn, and we're going to use their property player ID to find them. Player ID is equal to target subject, trigger subject, ability user, property, player ID. Okay, so this will make it so that it only resets on the, the wizard's turn when his turn starts. And let's save this real quick. And I wish I had a way to just have it keep that selected when I save it. Uh, discard reset. Here we go. Okay, then the thing we need to have it do is make it go, um, this can be, this should be target uh, assigned. Okay, new set attribute, and, or sorry, not set attribute, set trait, and we want to basically reset this flag now to type, uh, where's that flag? Flag, draw on discard is equal to zero. Okay, and this can just be done in the background without any kind of animation. So let's just make this be execute on trigger. We don't need to show any kind of cast animations or anything for that. Actually, we probably need that because there's no cast animations. So let's just leave it as that. Close that. Okay, let's hit save. Okay, and uh, I think all we have to do is give that to the wizard and we should be good to go. Let's go back to Rainman. The wizard, and I'm going to give him discard, where is it called? I think we call it discard reset, right? Yeah, naming things is one of the hardest parts of uh, programming. <laughs> Coming up with names you will remember that are meaningful. Draw a card whenever you cast and once per turn discarding. All right, we've saved him and we are good to go. Oh, let's also make sure we send him to functional. We had a problem last time where I forgot to set that and then he wasn't actually in the game. Save and go back. 
Primary Feather says, I can't even begin to imagine how much work must have gone into this editor. So many options and possibilities. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, it, it's been, um, I, I like to say that we've, we, we haven't just been developing a game. We've been simultaneously developing this, this tool, this engine. Um, it's obviously made the development process take longer, but I've done it to establish our roots so that long term going forward, I can service this game and deliver regular content updates to our players um, very rapidly. Uh, because I think new content is important. That, that, that does help keep this game fresh and exciting and interesting. And it really goes with the spirit of our, like I said, community driven development where we all kind of pool ideas and, and make cool stuff and put in the game. And the, the greatest thing about this editor that's so awesome is that uh, because all this information is all coded via just pure data, I can deliver this expansion over the air um, without having to do an additional client update. So there's no no need to go through review processes with the third party publishers. At the end of the stream or after we're done making these changes, I'm going to push this update onto the cloud. And the next time you open up the game, you will have all these new characters. It's, it's so awesome. So awesome. All right. Um, so we've got that working. Um, we got to test out uh, Rainman now to make sure that his power resets correctly. So once again, we're going to go ahead and cast a spell. His draw power worked correctly. Uh, I'm going to discard the teleport, and then I'm going to also attempt to discard another card. Okay, so his discard only worked once per turn. That's correct. And now we just need to confirm that when I start a new turn, the power resets. So let's end our turn. That's interesting. The cards are supposed to reveal at the start of the turn. Okay. So now let's cast this. Okay, so I can't cast Force Field. So we make sure if I discard Force Field, I drew another card. Good. And let's make sure that power only works once per turn. And it did. All right. So we've got a comment here from Scribe. What about draw a card each time you cast and on the first discard of your turn? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. That's probably a better way to uh, word it. Yeah, we can change that wording. Um, let's go back and change that. All right. So um, we've just confirmed his power works. Um, whenever he cast a spell, he drew a card. Um, and the first time I discarded, he was able to draw a card, but not any subsequent time. All right. So Scribe's got some suggestions to make that wording a little bit more clear. So we're going to go back in here and just clean him up a little bit. Okay. Raymond Wizard. Okay. So he says, I'm going to just type it down here. Draw a card each time you cast and on the first discard of your turn. Okay. So let's see. There we go. Oh, why does that look all weird? Oh, it's because discard is a keyword. <laughs> and it's not discriminating the fact that there is a of there. Oh, the first discard. Huh. Oh, interesting. I've got a little bug there with my keyword replacer where it should have. All right, let me see if I can make Scribe's suggestion work here a little bit. Draw a card whenever you cast a spell and the first time discarding per turn. Oh, man, I'm trying to figure out how to fix that. Draw a card whenever you cast and the first time discarding per turn. Your first time discarding. No, see, I, I like the way Scribe has it written better, but the keyword is broken because it's replacing the discard with that. Yeah, see, I, I did some tweaks to that last time around. And I apparently have a situation here where I've got to fix that. So I'm going to screenshot this guy so I can go back and look at this and debug it for a future client fix. So that, that's going to be a client change there to fix that thing. All right, so how about for now, we'll leave it as is, but I will change it to scribe suggestion once we've got that last part working. And also, why is it, there we go. All right, so we'll keep it for now, but I like scribe's wording. So once I fix that keyword discrepancy where it's gapping it like that, um, we'll change the text to, to match that. Okay, so wizard is done. All right. So we've got two new summoners added to the game today, and those will go out in our DLC update, which we'll do in just a minute. 
Um, now, before we get to the uh, single player uh, development preview, I want to do a quick few balance changes. So again, I'm all about player feedback and I've been monitoring the Discord channel, chatting with folks here, listening to kind of some of the different things you guys have called out as far as, um, you know, broken or needs concern in the game. So I made a, sh a short little list of those items. And so what we're going to do is apply those balance changes to the game here so that um, we can um, have those upgrades made. Let's see, Scribe also said, do you not want the keyword to appear so that the player gets the explanation of what it means? Scribe, I do want the keyword to appear. Uh, the issue was that it was formatting it weird. Um, it was replacing the space at the end with a character deletion. So I've got to go in and add some additional logic so it's smarter about how it's detecting that keyword. Um, the reason it's doing that is because there was another keyword situation where I was concatenating two different abilities. And so I had to adjust it so I could find lowercase versions of the word. Um, anyway, it's, it's going to be a quick logic change, but I'll, I'll have it fixed for the next build. It's on my, it's on my list of to do's now. Uh, I just didn't want to have typos in the card because that looks bad. Okay. So here are some of the, uh, balance changes we had. Um, and we're going to go ahead and fire through these really quick to adapt the game. Um, we're going to start at the bottom, oddly enough, because, uh, I, I really like this change. This was suggested by Maltross who's watching today. Um, we built a summoner last time, Kaylin, who I'm going to pull up now. And Kaylin is, is a really special character because she is based off of the likeness of my wife, Kelly. Um, where is she at? And she's one of the summoners in the game. Yeah, I surprised her on her birthday. I had a character made after her. So this it's, it's really good representation, too. This is what, really what she looks like. She's got that big old smile. Um, but she's the Valkyrie mage. Her main power is that she can basically disarm whoever she attacks which makes her awesome. She can just charge in, knock out a character, and they can't attack back, either counterattack or on their next turn they can't attack. So it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, but even still, compared to some of the other summoner's abilities, it can be a bit of a disadvantage um, because a whole bunch of characters can then swarm on her. Putting a summoner, your, you know, your main character, into the heart of the enemy is, is always risky. But as, as Meltras astutely pointed out, giving her the Vigil ability would let her go into the middle of enemy territory and hold her own. So I really like that suggestion, and we're going to put that in. And the great thing about this is that it's like a five-second change here. I literally just have to go and find the existing Vigil ability. There it is, and add it. And now, boom, she's got that power. Yeah, this is another case where I, I don't like how the, <laughs> the card is deciding to format here. I'm going to have to add some, like, something, some kind of smart logic to make it so these cards don't do these goofy, you know, line breaks like that. Summoner, Vigil, Inflict. I wonder if I know the Inflict is a trigger, so it always goes after that. Yeah, that just looks funny to me. Uh, inflict, can't attack until... Uh, let's change that. I'm going to change that power to like one round or something like that. Can't attack until end of next turn. Can't attack. Let's go back to that power. Ranged abilities. What was that power called again? Uh, can't attack, inflict, can't attack. Oh, it was a triggered ability. Triggered ability, inflict. Here we go. Oh, okay. It's a subtype of cannot attack, which is status effect. Cannot attack. Oh, okay. I can't do it because this is this is concatenating from the description of end turn. Okay, I can't fix the goofy wording, unfortunately, but we'll let that slide this time. Again, functionality over over polish right now. But uh, Kaylin has now got the uh, the vigil power as well. So unfortunately, I can't fix that little that little blurb there. Okay, so that one's done. I'm gonna go to my checklist here. Add vigil to Kaylin is done. Thank you for that suggestion, Meltras. Um, okay, I had a fun bug with the Swift Strike reported where it. Uh, works on melee units, or sorry, range units. So I'll show you the Swift Strike power and why this is a problem. So Swift Strike was a new surprise card we added um, a couple streams ago. And what it basically does is lets you get a uh, attack in as a surprise. Here it is. So when target unit is attacked, they strike the enemy first. So this is great. You, you basically play this card on your turn. The enemy doesn't know you're playing it. And then when they go to attack the character that has this power, they get to strike you first, which could potentially defeat them and negate their attack, which is awesome. 
However, um, this card currently triggers whenever um, an attack happens. So if a archer were to shoot you, it would trigger the swift strike. But because you may be a melee unit, you can't necessarily strike back at that character and therefore it's kind of wasted. So um, what I want to do with this card is change it to whenever they, um, when target unit is melee attacked, they strike the enemy first. And that way it will always have a correct contact. So we're going to save that. But now we need to actually change its ability and effect. So we've got to go and reprogram a little bit of this surprise swift strike in here. So let's go to triggered abilities. We're going to go to that surprise, uh, where is it? Surprise swift strike. Oh man, why do I have two of these on here? Counters. Oh man, I, I, I remember now when we did this, we had created two versions of this and I'm not sure which one it is. Oh dear. All right, let's go back and look at that status effect so I can figure out which one of these powers it is. I clean up my work here. All right, surprise, swift strike. It looks like we used version two. Swift strike two. Okay, trigger abilities. Okay. And this is probably the not used version. I'll have to look at that later. Okay, but let's make this one the official one. Okay, so what we need to do here is add context for the character being um, surrounding. All right, so let's look at our logic here. We've got it as um, melee attack. Okay, um, I need to find another example of a melee attack to figure out how we're going to do this. So a good example of that one is the force field. Uh, let's see, where's that, where's that force field one? Okay. Is this the one I'm thinking of? Remove? No, I want the one that says remove force field. That's the one that's got the melee logic. Remove. Here we go. Okay, so here's how I did the melee logic. So we're going to write, take some notes here. So event activator is adjacent to event target, group one. And I'll kind of explain in a second what these groups mean. And then the other one was event action dot action context equal to melee, and that's group two. And the other one is event activator dot range is less than or equal to zero, group two. Okay, it's kind of a convoluted way to define what melee was, but I had all kinds of fun trying to figure out what a melee attack was, and the reason it was complicated was normally melee is just adjacent to character, but there are abilities like spears where you can melee attack somebody from a diagonal, but ranged characters can also shoot people from a diagonal, so we did not want to have it trigger when it's a bow and arrow um, shooting from an angle, but if it's a spear, then it counts as a melee attack. Um, Although, come to think of it, with, with this particular case, we probably want it to be just adjacent to, because there's no guarantee that the swift striker is going to have a diagonal attack. So the more I think about it, actually, we probably just need to make it be that one condition. Um, let's go back to surprise. Uh, let's see here. Where is that guy? Um, swift strike. There we go. OK. Um, counters before being hit by attack. All right, so let's go ahead and change these things around. Um, event action contacts melee group one. What we want to do is get rid of this ranged. Yeah. I want this to be trigger subject. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's get rid of the group on this. This is going to be a permanent condition. And then let's change this to, in fact, we don't even need this. Let's remove that. The only condition that matters is that the person's adjacent. So event activator, who's the, the caster of the person who's attacking us in this case. Um, let's get rid of this. We don't want property. We want is adjacent to, and we want this to be trigger subject ability user. Okay, 
and we just get rid of this group too as well. So what I did here was made it so that um, it's going to be actually, we, we don't want to use the word melee. We want to use the term adjacent to because um, that will guarantee that the swift strike will only trigger when it can definitely be used. Okay. And uh, let's go ahead and save this. And let's go back to the spells swift strike. Swift strike. Okay, when target unit is attacked by adjacent enemy, they strike first. Okay, there we go. That's that's the way the alert wording should be. So we'll have to save that, and we'll go ahead and test that out too. Let's go do that really quick. Dex. Um, Let's make a quick test deck here. Let's remove these things. I'll put it in this deck here. Swift strike. There we go. Update. And let's go ahead and save. And let's go test that out. Booyah. All right. So test. And here we go. Forgot to put the test deck on. Let's make sure that's transfer test is what we were doing. That's what I called it. Yeah, there we go. Boom. All right. So now we can test out that deck card again, and uh, let's just make sure it still works. Oh, I got to put my cheats back on. Okay. Okay. Good. That worked. So she got to attack first. Now we we also want to check, test and make sure that the range characters don't hurt it. So let's throw a, I don't know, goblin archer in there. First strike again. Okay, so she did not trigger it. That's good. And then let's make sure okay, it doesn't trigger it here. No, swift strike will not work if they both have lunge. Um, they, it, it will only work if they're attacked adjacent. And we change the wording to make sure that's clear. When target unit is attacked by adjacent enemy, they strike first. Um, that's the best way to handle it because I, I suppose I could probably get it to work if we did the diagonal as well, but we'd have to add a bunch of logic in there to check if they've got the lunge ability. Um, so we could do it that way. If you want to get if you want to get weird, we can get weird. Um, but that did not work, and let's make sure this works. Okay, good. Excellent. And I think the cool thing about this, let's 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 pretend that this guy had been. Uh... Okay, so this is why first strike is cool. So in this case, she's going to overkill the goblin, and so he doesn't even get to attack her, which is kind of fun. Okay, so um, that fixes that. Again, uh, scribe, if you want if you want to want me to change that so that it works with lunge, just let me know. I'll add that to the back burner, but. The immediate issue is fixed. I, I didn't like how before it would waste the power if somebody tried to shoot her. So that's why it was important to use the adjacentness. Okay. Um, samurai. Yes. We'll have to get Samurai in the game at some point. I'll, I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll put a note here in my list here. Throw the Samurai card up on the forums. And then I'll give you a list um, with um, ideas. And then uh, after the stream, you guys can debate what powers you want the Samurai to have. The next stream, I'll, I'll throw the Samurai in the game for you. Okay, so we got that done. Um, let's see, some other quick ones. One of them here was to make the offsides card require line of sight. So playing a lot of games with different people, I realized, uh, and I got feedback that this card currently, it's a very powerful card. And I, when I initially designed it, I didn't think it was strong enough for the cost of two. Um, so I made it so you could use it on any character on the board, but the primary feedback I got was change this so that it's visible. So we're going to just change that targeting. So swap position of your character with visible unit. Okay. So that balance changes that. That's done. Okay. Offside now requires line of sight. That's done. Okay, um, other things we had on here, grapple spell. Yeah, we, I had meant to change the range of the grapple spell, so let's go back and change that. Um, grapple. 
So in this case, uh, this was a spell, pull visible unit three spaces towards you. The reason it's too powerful right now is because uh, as currently written, it can provide a almost, or sometimes in, in case like a guaranteed first turn win, depending upon the map size, by pulling a character in the range of all the starting characters. So uh, we want to just limit the range of this so it kind of functions like the, uh, the gladiator's ability. Um, instead, so you can't just use it on anybody. So we're going to change this to primary range three. Well, it makes sense too because it's supposed to be like a grapple hook. So three and pull a visible enemy unit um, up to three spaces away towards you. Pull a visible unit up to three spaces away towards you. There we go. So that one's changed. Um, let's go test that real quick to make sure it works as expected. So go back to our transfer test again and we're going to add the grapple spell in here to make sure that worked as expected. Okay. Test again. Okay, so everybody's, oh, that's not good. Why is it work? It works on himself. Huh. I never realized you could use grapple to pull your own units toward you. That's kind of weird. And also in this case, oh, he's out of range, huh? <laughs> and and that's strange. No one's reported that before. Yeah, you can use grapple on yourself. That's kind of kind of funky. Interesting. So grapple could be used to pull allies away out of situations. I had never known that. That's weird. Um, okay, let's go back and change a couple things with that spell real quick. Then, grapple. I didn't, I never realized it could be a multi-use card in that sense. That's kind of fun. You could get over here, ally, get out of danger. <laughs> um, so we want to make it so that obviously a target subject, target um, not equal to the ability user. The other thing we want to make sure is that target subject, target is uh, not adjacent not adjacent to. Not surrounding is probably better because he wouldn't be able to pull something toward you if you were surrounding. Not adjacent to ability user. It doesn't make sense to be able to pull things if you can't pull them. Okay, let's save that again and try it out. Okay. Okay, so in this case, there we go. I can't cast this card now. If I had this card over here, still can't do it. If I had her over here, one, two, three spaces away, I can pull her toward me. Cool. So that worked as expected. And if I go over here, all right, so one, two, three. He should be out of range. He is. If he is over here. Excellent. Okay, so that worked as expected. Good. All right. Um... So we fixed gravity so that it's based on range now. So that's done. Okay, um, some other quick changes we had. Oh, this was a very important one. So I discovered, uh, I'm gonna pull up a video here for you guys. This is kind of fun. So this is this is a reason why we have to look at balance changes very carefully. This is a game I played against, uh, I think it was, I think it was. Combo! This is my first turn playing. <laughs> okay, so you see why that is a bad thing. What happened is I was able to beat him in my first turn without him ever getting a chance to play. And that's kind of awesome but also really really bad because it indicates a huge balance problem if the opponent never got to react um it's kind of an unfair win so um i thought it was a result of these these characters of the flying being too powerful but then i looked at what the actual issue was and it wasn't the grapple hook of the mantis it was the fact that he was close enough to be able to pull her into into my horde of guys on the first turn and really the issue turned out to be the map design you see here that normally they're characters kind of start a certain minimum distance apart. And in this case, one, two, three, four, five, I mean, he, she was easily in range to grapple and for all my characters to fly over and attack her in the first shot. 
So the balance change here is really to adapt the maps. So what we're going to do here is, is take a look at our multiplayer maps, which I have down here, and just make sure that we fix these so that they don't have that situation happen again. So let's look at uh, that particular one I believe was called the um, Lich King Throne, Lich King Lair. Yeah, this guy. So what we're going to do here is change these starting positions to be a little bit more fair. Um, and what I need for this is the terrain spawn points. Okay, and we can actually do this with these, which is fun. So I'm going to reset, change these spawn points. Boop -a -doo. Uh, boop -a -doo. Um, maybe what we want to do is move these guys back even. Rotate. The game is still pretty loud when sound effects are going on. Oh, yeah, I apologize for that, Scribe. I think that was because the YouTube video I just played had its own separate volume meter. I was just watching, replaying a video. Um, but I will go ahead and when the game test starts, I'll, I'll ratchet down here a little bit more as well. Okay, so um, let's rotate these guys. Do, do, do. Okay. Okay, and we're going to make sure these are the right team. And I want to make sure that this is the hero spawn. Okay, and then let's get rid of these. Um, trying to think how we want to do this. So we can actually have him start there is fine. So I think that's what we'll do. We'll have the summoner on this level start here. There we go. Rotate. Rotate rotate and just for for fun i'm going to go ahead and reuse that same team i had just had for my test to make sure that it's now balanced so that i think that was click click i had as a summoner and then we had uh well flying it's fine and then we had the griffin was the other one quad griffin okay Okay, so yeah, this is the situation we had before looking at the YouTube video where the character started here and that put her in range of the my character in the first turn. Now we've moved the summoner down here. So this is actually kind of nice. Now I'm actually out of sight. And as you can see, I can no longer reach with my staff. One, two, three. So that's a safe distance here. Okay, and this is actually cool. So from this current position, nobody's in line of sight. All right, so that was a, a quick map change. So we're going to save this. So now that balance issue with the map is now fixed. Um, but we want to take a look, quick look at the other maps here to make sure that uh, we don't have any further problems with the minimum distance. So this is a big map. There's nothing issue there. Wasteland. Let's see if I can hit you from over here. If I could fly one, two, three, and then a range of grappling hook. One, two, three. Yep, that one's good. This is a fun map. I always get so many comments on this map because of its spawn location. Um, players are thrown off because, hey, why are the characters like all spread out here on this one? And I, I do that intentionally. Like I, I like to make folks uncomfortable and to kind of break the expected a little bit. This, so this whole map, the idea was that you're sort of in this ambush situation. Um, now, I do think that the summoner might still be too close. Yeah, it is, um, because I can still pull you into the first turn. That's not good. So we got to move this character back here. Um, but aside from that, it's it's not um, a necessarily unfair map. This guy can hit here because he can normally fly that far anyway, but I could also hit you if I was over here. Um, normally, this character would be out of range for anybody that's a three-space move. So this one here is a pretty simple fix. We just need to uh, move the hero space back one. Save that. Okay, spider caves. This looks fine. We've got snow pass. Oh, this might be one that has to be fixed. Okay, so this one I can hit you in the first turn, but um, the advantage here is that these other characters can't. So I'm going to leave this as is. It's not going to have the same advantage, and I would actually put myself in a very vulnerable position to charge that way. So that's pretty safe balance-wise. Oh, I meant to turn the sound effects down for Scribe a little bit. Let's see, go back to game options. Let's put this as uh, seven. There we go. That's pretty quiet now. 
Okay, so skeleton crypt. Uh, this one's got the correct distance, no problems there. This one, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so this one, the summoner is in range here, but because the characters are spread out, it should be okay. Okay, Lich King Lair, we just we fixed that one already. Jungle Bloom, this one's fine. Oh, this is an interesting one. This one may have some problems. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, that's a big problem right there. He's too close. Uh, especially because he's starting closer than he should. So we should adapt this guy right here. Um, let's reset this level. Let's go back to terrain. Let's move the hero position back here. And let's move his hero position back here. And that should create the minimum safe distance. See, so this is an interesting case of balance where the, the problem was entirely with the map, but I never saw it because we didn't have this character with the ability to hook people in the first turn. So now it's not safe distance. Okay, and so we save that. Hide behind trees. This one's fine. Grass world's fine. Gladiator pit is. That one's definitely big enough. Ah, fall scene. This is another interesting one where it looks like I may have started him too close. Yep, that's a bad one. Um, now, it's not as bad because I can't get everybody ganging up on me in the same turn. Like that video showed. I suppose I could get the griffin to both attack that same turn, but even still, I don't want to have you pulling the mage in the first turn. So what we're going to do to fix this guy is uh, just move that hero start location back one. There we go. Test again. Yeah, that's good. Yep, okay, cool. So save this guy. This map's fine. And this map is good. How about Desert Road here? That one's definitely fine. Butterfly Forest. And Armory is good. Okay, cool. So it looks like we've got all the maps rebalanced, so I can check that off my list here. Okay, and then a couple other quick things we had were Psychic Blast allow the damage on the summoner, but not the mind control part. So currently Psychic Blast, I, I realize I've had a few decks where I've seen people playing that, and you can't actually cast it on summoners. Um, and that was intended because we didn't want to have its power of mind control stealing the summoners, but there's no reason it shouldn't be able to damage um, summoners. So we're gonna change that spell. So this was the Psychic Blast spell. Uh, do, 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 P, Psychic Blast, here we go. So this guy here, deal two psychic damage to enemy minion if this brings life to three or less commanded. So we're gonna change that to deal two psychic damage. If this brings, um, Minion to three or less life. Deal three damage. Um, okay, and then there we go. Okay, so deal two psychic damage. If this brings a minion, oh, that doesn't read right. If this brings a minion to if this brings a minion to three or less life command it. There we go. Okay, so what we want to do here is just remove this condition that says you cannot target the hero. And uh, remove that. I think that's all we have to do. But let's test that out because I want to make sure it doesn't accidentally mind control the, uh, the uh, enemy summoners. So let's go back to our decks here and go into our transfer test and let's throw that guy in there. Spell Psychic Blast. So this is one of those instances where we were taking an existing card and we're adding some more versatility to it. I think it's very important to always revisit the existing content to make sure it's relevant with the within the game's balance. That's why I do this. Okay. 
So I can target the enemy summoner now, which is good. But uh, let's change the summoner to something that's that's smaller and weaker. Um, let's how about we do the archer. I want to make sure I don't accidentally command the summoner with its power. Good, I did not. So that was what you're looking for. Normally, if I cast this on a minion like this guy, now I control him. Cool. So that's fixed. Easy fixes. I love easy fixes. Okay, and then the last two items we had were to change the gravity well's pull, so it didn't pull so much. I'm not sure if I want to change that guy yet. Um, I'm going to leave that one on the docket for discussion. Um, and then the other one was allow cleansing fire to target a unit of space so it could be used to reveal stealth. Um, this also fixes an issue where it reveals surprises. Um, that one's a little bit more involved as well. So let's, uh, let's table those for now. Um, I'll keep those on my to-do list, but I'm going to push these other changes here. So... You guys ready for the DLC update? We're going to get two new summoners today, and it uh, looks like six balance changes I've added into the game. All right. Who's excited for the wizard and the priestess? Oh, yeah. All right. So here's how we do the DLC updates, everybody. We're going to go to my um, definitions here I just copied. This is the latest version of Def's Summoner's Fate website. Uh, DLC. Paste this in here. Okay, so this is the this is the basically the loading station for this. I've already got my manifest file here that's defining we are version 31 client now, and we're going to upgrade this to client version um, 0.31.2, and we want to make sure that the definitions is version two. Everything else content-wise is staying the same. Okay, so we're going to do our famous before and after test. Um, in order for this to be tested correctly, I need to first uh, make sure I have the proper version of my game installed. Because um, right now I've got the newer version on there. Let's make sure I install version 31.1. Scribe says, yay! Okay. Okay, so I'm launching up my game now. This is the current build of the game, version 31.1. And we're going to confirm before and after to make sure our DLC test is successful. So here we go. I am in the game, and if I go to my cards here, go to my collection, um, so the two cards we know we were adding are going to be the wizard and uh, the priestess, so we're just going to gonna search for those guys. Wizard. There he is. Okay, so you can see right now he's currently disabled because we have not pushed the DLC yet. And we're also going to search for the priestess. Okay, and she is also not enabled because we have not added her to DLC yet either. So um, we're going to now go ahead and push the DLC and then reboot the game and see if everything works okay as expected. So exit game, and I'm going to go ahead and go to Dreamweaver here. Huh, what? Do you want to continue with? Yeah, yes, connect to my s site. I don't know. Okay, let's refresh this. Okay, so I'm going to update manifest and definitions. And here we go, put files to remote server. This will push the DLC out to everybody. No. Okay. Okay, so DLC has been pushed. Now we're gonna fire up the game again and see that that DLC should be working. So here we go, Summoner's Fate. All right, 31. I did say the I, I may have missed it. It's happened so fast. 31.2. Okay, so the version number incremented correctly. It's loading the game up. Okay. Uh, whenever the game version increments, it has to recache the cards. Uh, at some point, I will optimize that so it doesn't have to rebuild the entire cache for for minor updates because that's just a an excess of system resources. So typically, what, when it happens, you'll see for a moment there'll be a black screen. It looks like it's already finished. Uh, but there it is. Priestess is available, and let's check out the wizard. He should be available as well. And there he is. Okay, so you guys have new content today. Um, wizard and Priestess are now selectable summoners in the game, so you can go ahead and start building decks with them. I'll, I'll demonstrate that from here. Oh, I've reached the maximum decks. That's okay. I'll, I'll hide it an existing one. All right, so if I go to summoner here, let's turn off my filters. So now I can now I can select my new summoners here in the list. Where are they? Priestess, here we go. Oh yeah, Void and 
Celestial, that's going to be a fun one, right? Cool. So that's all working, and uh, we've completed that. And now we are ready to start talking about the, uh, the single player. So let's see how much time we've got left here on the stream. All right, we've got, uh, we've got about an hour still, so I'm excited. We've got a lot to talk about regards to single player. I'm going to go ahead and get the, the current build installed so I can kind of talk you through some of the things I've added so far and how this is progressing. Yeah, very cool. I'm glad you got to see that, uh, Daniel. I, that was, I'm really excited about our DLC thing, so that's definitely one of the tech things that, that's got me stoked for sure. All right. So this is the this is the new build I'm installing right now, the, my my dev build. All right, um, I, I suppose I should probably provide some context about our single player and exactly what it is. I'm going to exit out of this real quick. Um, so I'm going to share a blog post with you guys so you can kind of follow along. Once again, this is our website, summonersfate.com. I'm going to go to the forums, and then I'm going to go to actually I think I have a faster way of getting here. I think it's adventures.summonersfate.com. There you go. I, I like to create subdomains to relevant things of, of interest. So in, inside the current build, there's actually a, a link that goes to this, um, but I put it here as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit first about what our single player is, why it's awesome and why you should care about it. And then I'm going to kind of share a little bit about how I'm actually going about developing it. So uh, the original name of this game was actually going to be called Prophecies. Um, and sort of taking on a little bit of the lore from Hero Mages, which is all about this mysterious prophecy that said a hero would arise uh, to greatness and rule the lands and whatnot. And I I'm a big fan of RPG games like Dungeons and Dragons for the sense of the exploration of the unknown. And I really like it when you can be thrown into this environment where you're you know given this really great atmospheric context like you and a party of your adventures have entered a dank smelly cave you know the the rot of mushrooms enters your aroma and so forth and then like you hear clicking in the distance you know and what's that clicking going to be i don't know but it just sort of thrusts you into this whole idea of there's like an adventure about to happen and it gets you really excited to to be part of this world, discover your role in that world, discover how you're going to work together with your teammates and solve this mystery that's about to happen. And so when I created, originally designed the idea for Summoner's Fate, uh, the, the two big features people wanted from Hero Mages were custom decks and single player. And I really wanted our single player to be something that could be, that could capture the essence of that experience I just described. You're thrust in this world and you can just kind of go at it without having to know too much about the surrounding things. So I would describe it as like an atmospheric style storytelling. Uh, there's story, but it's light. And most of the storytelling is kind of in your own mind. Like based on the events you encounter and the things you see, you sort of tell yourself a story as much as the game is providing you with visuals and, and different events to kind of supplement that. So that, that whole mechanic, I call that the prophecies mechanic. And the way I envisioned it being delivered was through a really simplistic um, style map. Like you find this scroll with like a treasure map. And I thought a treasure map is cool because it gives you a good like sense of like, ah, alluring. There's a treasure I want to find. Here's the map. And you have to kind of go on this adventure to get to the end, right? And then we had sort of this like a early artist concept we had for the idea where it'd be like the sort of saga style map. These kind of big colorful icons that sort of indicate your path to an objective. Good morning. Welcome, Clever. Also, Login. Um, good to see you here on the stream with us today. You're just in time. You showed up just as we have started talking about the single player development. And right now, I'm just giving some context for what our single player is all about. And then I'm going to start diving into the, the work I've done so far and kind of where it's going. And then I'm going to, of course, pull you guys for feedback because as much as I know about how I want it to work, there's so much I don't know about how I want it to work. And that's why I'm so excited to have uh, your guys' feedback. Scribe says that version 3.1.2 is on his device. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, yeah, earlier in the stream, we did uh, we added two new summoners to the game. We did a number of balance changes, and we just pushed out our second DLC update, which is now live. And it requires no work on your part. Just boot the game up, and you've got some new cards to play with. I'm... So stoked about that. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of sharing this page now, which is you can get to by going to adventures.summonersfate.com, and it'll take you to this blog. And just kind of telling the story of this uh, saga map that represents sort of like how I envision these prophecies 
coming into the into the game. And so the way I thought about it working was, um, you know, if you played procedural based games or roguelike games, the idea is that uh, you get a set of randomly con constructed levels um, that kind of connect together in interesting, unexpected ways. So each time you play, there's a unique adventure. And we're also going to introduce some concepts of like permadeath and other things. So the idea will be that you'll find one of these treasure maps. It'll be a co cool story, you know, like find the treasure, defeat the boss, um, save the princess or whatever kind of ideas we have. And I hope to have a lot of these ideas. I hope to get your feedback on possible themes for prophecies. And then as you play, you're going to, of course, build your character up, um, collecting new cards, finding new uh, party members. And then when you beat the quest, you'll, of course, get those cards you unlocked added to your collection that you can then use to build new custom decks with for subsequent adventures or to take to battle other players in PvP. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, kind of real quick, again, I'll highlight some of the goals. Uh, I had five high-level design goals. Uh, the first is to create opportunities for meaningful player choices that encourage risk versus reward thinking and have a permanent impact to the campaign and lasting rewards. So when I say rewards, I mean like meaningful things, something that impacts gameplay, like unlocking a new character. And um, something that would be considered a risk would be like, you know, a permadeath of a character. So um, games are really fun when there's something, there's stakes, right? And that's why I love the idea of like the roguelike permadeath concept where you're going to go on this quest and you've got this sort of pressure to survive. It's not just sort of a handholdy walk through, follow the treasure map. It's going to be a very thinking, um, what do I want to risk versus what I want to get in return, right? In terms of the, the rewards. So there's high stakes. That's, that's one of the goals. Um, the, the second thing is if you're going to have high stakes, you need to have fair opportunities to assess those choices. So the game has to introduce random, but in a way that gives the player some ability to make choices about what they're going to be risking and how much risk they want or willing to put into it. So that's kind of one of the themes. And we'll, we'll talk about that as I kind of showcase some of the features of how this may work. But just keep that in mind that I want it to be fair or feel fair um, that the experience you're having is when, if you lose, it's a, it's a consequence of a risk you knowingly took and that you accept that decision and that failure and then you grow from it, right? Versus like the game just sort of slap me with an unfair random. We don't want that. Um, I want to have it so the experience seamlessly integrates the onboarding to deck building. So if you play games like Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering or other collectible card games, you know, this is probably nothing new to you. You understand the idea of building decks, but to a lot of players, it's a new experience. And one of the things that a lot of these other existing games don't do very well is is invite new players with a really successful onboarding that takes you through the experience. They, they tend to throw you right into the competitive experience, um, and that turns off a lot of new players. I really want to have it so that players um, feel welcome to the game, that the single player is a standalone, fully enjoyable experience. If you never want to play competitively, this is something that's going to help you both uh, learn and, and, and understand the deck building and, and also... Um, be a, be a great experience in itself. Um, all right, then let's talk about the length. Um, so prophecies are meant to be short. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about three to four hours to beat a campaign or to beat the game. So that's typically how most roguelikes work. They have similar play sessions, but the, the thing is that makes them unique is that every time you play the game, it's gonna be a totally different experience. Um, but my goal here is um, I, I talk about this idea of episodic content where when you play the game, you are, um, able to consume it in bite-sized chunks. So if you're playing on your phone and you've only got three minutes, you can finish a battle and, and make meaningful progress toward your campaign. But if you want to sit down at your PC and, and, and binge play for like a regular, you know, full-length gaming session, you can still do that with this. It's, it's meant to be fully scalable. And then, uh, oh yeah, I guess there's the episodic content, high replayability. So the idea is that um, I want to continue to service and add content to the game. So as we add new cards and content, we're also going to add new prophecy themes. So, you know, different configurations of the procedural dungeon so that every time you play, you've got multitudes of options. Like maybe at some point there'll be preferences like, I really want to go through and fight the skeletons and have a skeleton adventure. Or I want to have an orc fighting adventure. Or I want to have a, you know, insect world adventure. You know, all these different types of themes can be things that ultimately get um, set as parameters and the player preferences to, to how you want to play. So always new content, always new episodes. Those are the high levels. So now let's talk about uh, some of the development that's going into this. 
And uh, Clever says, good roguelike design. If you lose, it's always your fault, not just bad RNG. Yes, absolutely. I can't stress that enough in terms of uh, the feeling we want to have players take away from our game. That it, I lost, but it was fair, and, I, and it, it made me motivated to try again. Okay, so um, let's talk about this map first, because um, this is something I'm kind of excited about, uh, the, the, this idea of the prophecy map. Now, again, this is an early concept design with a fairly simplistic path and just five nodes to it. Um, but it, you can see here that there's not necessarily many choices in where you can go or how you can do things. It's sort of provided for you. So one of the ways we sort of expanded that is by developing this uh, procedurally generated branching path. I'm going to show you what that looks like here in our editor tool. So I mentioned that the tool is, you know, you guys are already familiar with things like the map editor that lets me construct individual levels, the VFX editor, the um, spell card editor, etc. But I have never shown you guys the prophecy maps editor. So let's take a look at this. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, here you go. So these are, um, you guys are probably familiar with, uh, where is this guy at? This guy, this is your choose your mission. This is what's currently in the build. Um, I've got the standard tutorial and the Lich mission, but um, this, this also supports dynamic node maps like you see here. So these are branching paths and kind of let me talk a little bit about the idea of this here, but um, you can flip this as well, which is fun. So, hello. Hey, welcome that guy, Core. Thanks for joining our stream today. Appreciate you being here with us. You are um, just in time to get an exclusive first look at our single player development process. This is the first time I'm ever sharing this uh, with the community. Um, so the game we're making is called Summoner's Fate, top-down fantasy adventure. And uh, it's gonna be able to have both PVP and single player. And the current build we have in early access now supports our PVP. And over the next couple of months, I'm going to be integrating our single player. And let's see, he says back, oh, cool. looks kind of like Slay the Spire on the pass and stuff. Yes, I, I have heard that uh, feedback before, yeah. Um, and then uh, we also have Clever saying, a wild graph theory appears. And then, yeah, I'm artist formerly known as Korea. Oh, welcome. Oh, excellent. Good to have you on the stream with us, Korea. So excited to have you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so this is just sort of like an early attempt I have at building out, um, taking that existing concept I was showcasing here and giving it some branching support ability. Uh, but what's really cool about this is that this map is completely randomly generated following procedural algorithms. And you can see I've got all kinds of fun little numbers here. These are the ways that I um, am able to tune this um, as developer to kind of create the experience we want. But I'm gonna go ahead and just show you some examples of rolling the dice here and how you can get very different types of paths uh, depending upon how this is configured, right? So this is kind of just uh, an example of different ways of creating different paths. Now, what's cool about this, so these different numbers at the top here and things like that allow me to configure anything from the number of tiers to the structure. So if we wanted to have like a really long map, I could boost this up. Let's say we wanted 15 instead, right? Now look at how this changes the map. Okay, but I've still got number of 30 nodes as the target. So if I change this to like, let's say, like we made this like 50 nodes. Now you get a really crazy map here. Maybe a little crowded for one screen. I'm excited for single player. Excellent. Yes, I am too. All right, so here's, so here's, some, here's some more roles. Um, another cool thing I can do with this is, um, so we've got this idea. I, I've been told by like the masters of procedurally generated content that the idea is you want to have um, islands of handcrafted in a sea of random. And that's, that's, the, that's the sort of wisdom that's been imparted to me um, in regards to procedural. And what that means is that uh, typically if you have an experience that's completely randomized, it can feel very shallow and disconnected. But if you can tie in handcrafted elements to sort of string that experience together, you can create an experience that feels both like intentionally designed, but also incredibly unique and exciting and fun. And so that's kind of one of the things I've attempted to do here. Um, I'm gonna explain how that works. So in this um, Dropbox here is basically where I input the formula for how we're gonna surface various types of levels and content to the player within this matrix. And I'm gonna reset this because it's a little bit overwhelming to look at <laughs> with that many nodes. Okay, and so in here, if you imagine these things as like a grab bag, you're gonna see this property here called weight. Okay, and you also see a property called tier number, all right? So 
any of these nodes could represent various things I want to throw in there. Like say I want to throw in there a mission with orcs or a random procedural dungeon or whatever it is, I can throw it in here. And right now these items are all equally weighted. They don't have any specific tiers assigned to them. And so they can basically appear evenly within the distribution. But let's say I wanted something like, you know what? I really want to have a lot more forest in this. So I could do something here where I could change the weight of the forest to be like a three, update that. And now when I generate, you're going to see that there's a lot more forests in the world than there were before. Okay, so that's one way I can kind of handcraft the experience or tune in a way to kind of deliver an experience somebody might be looking for. Another thing I can do is create explicit um, juncture points. So if we wanted to tell a story, like let's say one of the ideas I have, I really love the idea of the concept of the Lich King. And I love the idea that the Lich King is like, you know, trying to take over the world by, you know, sucking the life force out of everything. He's bringing these army of uh, zombies that we, in our game, we call them the Withereds. They're like these shriveled, husks of of people and animals that have had all their life force drained and they're sort of just mindless creatures um but maybe i want to create a quest or a prophecy about defeating this boss the lich king and his army of withereds um and i want to have that experience have like these random elements you can explore to kind of find things along the way that are unique to your experience but i want to have kind of key beats like maybe you encounter him for the first time in a battle how could i do that well um we could say that like maybe at this tier here, if, you, if we think about this as tiers, I'm going to kind of flip it so it looks a little bit more like a tier. Think of this like a cake, all right? So I call these levels tiers. So this is currently a 10 tier prophecy, I guess, where you start at the bottom, you move linear in, in a line across this to the top. So let's say I pick the tree here. When I beat this, I would have no choice but to go here. If I beat the skull, I could go here, here, or here. Um, but I would move in a line. And so if you kind of follow my mouse cursor here, I'm kind of going all the way up to the top. Boom, boom, boom. And that's how it would kind of go. So at any given tier, you're going to you're gonna play just one level in that tier. And it's up to you which path you want to take. That's how this would work. So if I wanted to have a story piece injected at a certain point, what I could do is say, I want to have like this volcano. Let's, let's just say the volcano for sake of argument is going to be happening at tier five. Okay, and update, and then I hit generate procedural. Now you're gonna see that everything converges on that specific tier to this particular level. So by doing that, I can have a very explicit experience delivered to the player where this kind of key story beat can now be always surfaced. So you'll still have a unique adventure where you choose your path, but at this particular point, you're gonna experience whatever the key beat in the story is to continue on. Or we could do things like add rest points or treasures or um, other mini bosses, whatever kind of things we want to throw in and handcraft how the, how the prophecy layout is generated. Um, so that's kind of how this, this system works. Um, and you click on these and play adventures. So any questions I can answer about, uh, kind of where we got this going so far in terms of like, uh, a high level design. Primary feather says, great idea. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and those are just some of the ways we can tune it. Um, I've got some other things in here as well. You're gonna see this encounter traits thing. This is another type of table, um, but we're gonna talk about the encounters next. That's the, that's the other fun part of the procedural. So this is just sort of the high level, you know, how you play things. So you beat a level, you get to make your choice on where you go, and then it'll kind of unfold the story as you go. Um, but there's also procedural within the procedural. So are you ready to explore the dream within the dream? <laughs> All right, and uh, clever name says seems straightforward to me. Okay, great. So th this looks like it's it's pretty familiar. Nothing too groundbreaking here. Um, yeah, a, a bunch of other games have used this structure in the past. Um, so nothing really new here. Just kind of took from existing things I'm familiar with and made our own little version of of that system here. Oh, the other cool thing I I can control it here as well. These these nodes at the end like I envision like this would be the end point. So naturally this would kind of narrow in a single tier, but these can be controlled as well um, by um, allowing you to tune these. Like, so I could say two, you could have two endings. Oops, this is what I want. There you go. Now there could be two possible endings to it, things like that. <laughs> Bra! Inception noise, yes. Okay, so let's, uh, that's kind of how the prophecy map structure is going to work at a high level. Let's look at the next level of, of procedural. So, um, procedural within the procedural. Um, so I have got this, uh, let's see where we have it at here. 
It is called the encounters, encounters table. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take a shot out there. Many of you guys may have played D&D &D before, and you're familiar with, like, random encounters or fighting monsters within a room. So, like, you, you encounter a room. What is the first thing that happens is the dungeon master will typically have some kind of parameters for the campaign they're running, and they'll grab a handful of dice and roll them on the board and then look at the dice and go, okay, based on these rolls, you're going to have five skeletons, a lich, necromancer, and you know, a dragon or something like that, and that sort of populates the room full of enemies. And it creates this cool experience because even the dungeon master, by using the dice, doesn't necessarily know what's going to be in the room. Uh, but they've got some kind of guidelines and rules for that dungeon being set up. Yep. Oh yeah, roll you into it, yo. Absolutely. All right. So um, this is sort of my first take at um, constructing something similar to how a traditional tabletop game might generate an encounter. And it's um, basically a series of tables where I can define the types of things I would like to appear and the parameters for which they can appear, right? So let's walk through some of these things. It's a little confusing, but uh, the first thing is just sort of like a high level description of what the encounter is. Um, we've got this traits thing. Now, this is really cool because the traits is a way to basically tag this encounter with various properties, such as like maybe I want to say, oh, it's an orc encounter, or it's a you know hard encounter, or it's a easy encounter, or whatever types of any type of property you could imagine filtering through, you could define here. And then when when I go to build that prophecy map, I can specifically query um, encounters of a certain type to inhabit that particular dungeon. Um, other things we've got here um, currently, I can define a hero. So this particular encounter has no enemy spellcaster. Um, I can define the rules for how it will surface when the player battles it. I can define the specific units I want in the encounter. So in this particular case, if you were to roll on your encounters table and get this particular one selected, you would fight one skeleton captain and two skeleton warriors. Okay? Um, so not super exciting. Um, and then this would be cards that could potentially appear as spells for the enemy. Let's look at a little bit more advanced one. Um, here we go, Necromancer. So Necromancer one, this one has um, a summoner. In this case, the, the caster is gonna be a Necromancer unit. And the rules I changed a little bit here made it so that um, the AI would not lose their heroes dead. Basically what that's saying is that for this particular encounter, you have to kill all of the enemies, not just the summoner like you normally would in a PVP battle. Uh, and Primary Feather says, sorry, I've gotta go now, Ross, but I'll definitely watch the rest later. I need to know how the rest of that works. Ciao. Ciao, Primary. It's Thanks again for joining us in the stream. A pleasure having you with us today. All right, so um, let's look at some other properties we've got here. Um, I've got this cards thing. So in this particular encounter, the Necromancer has a deck. Um, I've said that of the cards I've defined, she can pick two, and it just happens to be two drained lives. So this encounter will always have a Necromancer with two drained lives. But you can imagine here, if I want to spice this encounter up, I could include other types of cards. Maybe we throw in some skeleton dragons or summon skeletons cards, etc. And um, this property lets me pick how many cards the caster would get to choose randomly out of this pool. And then over here, um, this box represents the units that are randomly picked. So in this case, I'm saying I want to have a enemy supporting party of three to five characters consisting of skeletons and archers. And these are both weighted uh, with one character each. So they're the same, you know, and you can give different weights and numbers to each of these buckets. But that's the idea here. So this is going to create a kind of a random encounter. And then um, another type of parameter I thought would be fun to experiment with is to, to make it even more diverse is what if the character could come um, equipped with different things, right? So you're not just fighting a regular straight up necromancer, but you're going to fight a necromancer who has been modified in some way. Um, and I kind of think of this, like if you've ever, ever played like Diablo 3, they have characters like this where they call them like the mini bosses, where it'll be like a traditional enemy, but it gets upgraded to a boss and it maybe has some special powers and a kind of a unique name, like Thrug the Skull Crusher or something like that. And they, they look kind of like a regular monster, but then they've got some piece of equipment and some special abilities that make them even more distinctive and unique than you would normally face in the game. And so I wanted to have something like that too. We've got so many awesome abilities. Yeah, Maltra says, but they are electrified or something. Exactly. 
So I, I like the idea that, you know, we could spice up even further by taking the really fine granular bits of our game and allowing those to be surfaced into the into the encounter so that you could have like a, you know, a bow and arrow wielding necromancer or a shaman staff wielding necromancer or whatever it is. Um, and that would kind of be a custom modifier. So these are some ways I could do that here. Um, in this particular case, um, I gave it a pool of different equipment it can have. And each of these equipments give the character different powers. And for this encounter, the enemy can pick one piece of equipment from this list. Um, and then I also made it so that in this particular encounter, I wanted to test like, well, what if we gave them different status effects? Like maybe you came into a room and for some reason, all the enemies were on ice and they don't unfreeze until one turn after you've been in the room. So I was kind of playing with that here too. So we added a frozen effect. And in this case, zero means that it will pick all of the effects I apply here. So this encounter will, ins will spawn a necromancer who is, starts off frozen with one random equipment with two drain life cards and a random cohort of skeletons. So there you go. That is procedural within the procedural, right? Like really fine granular tooth procedural. All right, but now how do you get these encounters, right? How do you get the encounters into the game to actually face these monsters, right? So that brings us to the next uh, piece of the, the process here, which is our, our maps. And you know this may this may come as a shock, but you guys have seen some of this stuff already. We, when we've done our test here, I've got these several maps here that were my sort of take on different rooms and layouts, and you can kind of see these here. Um, so normally maps always have set spawn points attached to them, right? Where you kind of pick your starting locations for all the pitch battles that you have in PvP. But a procedural map doesn't have any spawn points because I wanted to have the monsters spawn in random locations, and that's exactly what you see here when I fire up. A game every time I start this up you notice that my characters are always kind of lined up at the door so what I've done here is written a procedural algorithm where my characters are always kind of exploring this dungeon and they always appear at the entrance and then the enemy sort of randomly distributes around the other half of the room and so this creates a unique layout each time where the battles themselves are gonna be very distinctive and different depending upon how those um, spawn locations roll um, for that particular level. So that's what's happening with these procedural maps. If I hit start again, you're gonna see a totally different configuration. And these configurations are very important because they can create very different ex play experiences. And right now the algorithm's not too smart. It's just literally randomly positioning them within the upper quadrant, I think here. Um, but eventually I can get smarter with it and maybe even have things like archers in the back, you know, big smashy guys in the front or however you want to have that algorithm work. We, th these can all be tuned to the nth degree of specification here. But that's just an example. Okay, so then the next thing is, well, how do you connect the dungeons together, right? Because the idea would be like you're kind of exploring room to room and you want to see different things. So how does that work? Um, so for that end, I have a um, playlist idea. So in this particular case, I define a playlist of possible levels. So for my first test, I just created a, a list of procedural. So these are just various dungeon rooms. And, you know, sometimes D&D or other games will use like a stack of cards and you maybe you have those represent the rooms in the dungeon and you kind of flip the cards over, right? And you build the dungeon as you explore it, right? So that's kind of the idea I had here was to kind of create a virtual simulation of flipping over tabletop dungeon cards and sort of building out the dungeon as you explore it. Um, so these are the maps. I just sort of added them in this list here. And let's take a look and see how that would work actually in the game. So if I go to maps and just we'll just pick a starting level here. And uh, what I'm going to do is, um, instead of just doing a regular start game, I'm going to start a procedural. And I'm going to pick from the procedural starting list and hit start procedural. And I think right now, um, these are all hard-coded configurations, but I think the dungeon length is set at five levels. And so um, there's no other configurations being set, so it's basically picking from any of my encounters and any of the rooms possible within my procedural list. So let's just go ahead and we'll grab slaughter these skeletons over here. And I, again, I've got my cheat codes on so I can just take infinite turns. I, mean, I wouldn't have infinite turns. But just for the sake of showing you guys kind of how the procedural levels work. And boom, kill that skeleton. And now the door opens up. Okay, and what room am I going to go into next? I have no idea because it's totally random. Let's go in there and see what we find. And it looks like I found a, looks like some kind of cafeteria style room in here, right? And uh, now I've got to battle these. It looks like I got this, this. I've only got three encounters, so there's not a whole lot of variety right now. Just skeletons again. But let's go kill these guys and see what's going on. 
I noticed the other fun thing is that my characters all carry over from the last room. Um, let's do something fun though. Let's have this angel get injured. Okay, so she's got a little bit of a wound on her now. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead. Now we got the uh, infinite moves because we're in explore mode. So let's fly over that table. Go, bug, go. Go to the next one. Oh, and this time we got the encounter with the skeleton captain, and we're in the hallway. All right, but notice that the uh, angel's life carried over. So this battle is taking into account the previous room's um, actions and carrying it over to the next room. Um, the same thing happens with spells. So if I were to say attack one of these guys and uh, use my psychic glass, now that card is gone and will not respawn in the next room. So I've got less cards to use now. And this is sort of where I was talking about the idea of resource management, where you've got to be really cautious about how you play your cards because now you've got to think about not just what's in the current battle, but what could be coming in the next room. And you're going to have some kind of information up front that we want to communicate to you about what may be in the dungeon and how many rooms may be in the dungeon, but you're not going to necessarily know what exactly is going to be in there. And what I want that to achieve is like create these tension moments. Like maybe you've got like a healing spell or a fireball in your hand ready to use, and you've got to make a choice like, is this the right time to use that fireball? Do I want to use the fireball and blast these skeletons away, or do I want to save that for the next room? Um, but in doing so, am I risking my characters getting injured? You know, So there's like a lot of push and pull, a lot of complex choices you have with that. So again, I'm just going to cheat my way through this. Oh, he blocked that. Yeah, get, get him. I got him. Ow. Okay. Okay, so let's see what's the next room. I'm kind of hoping we'll see that uh, crazy necromancer in one of these rooms. Let's see if we roll the necromancer this time. Nope, skeletons again. Let's kill these guys. Die! Crazy psycho, psycho mantis. All right, let's see if we get that necromancer this time. Ah, oh, skeletons again. I was really hoping we get that crazy necromancer with the weird frozen equipment. <laughs> but I guess that's it. All right, so this is level five. This would be the last room of this dungeon. Anyway, yeah, maybe there's some treasure. I haven't made the treasure do anything yet. It's just sort of decorative right now. But eventually that'll be interactive. And you'll be collecting gold and rewards and stuff like that. But this is, since this is the last level, this will now end my test simulation. So now you can kind of get an idea of, of how that works. Um, I'll try one more time. Maybe I'll see if I can roll that necromancer just to show her off. Show me that necromancer. Nope. You figure there's only three three encounters. It's a one in three chance, but we didn't get lucky. Roll again. Wow. Hey, you're being really stingy with that dice roll. Now I say rolls. Um, one of the one of the things I really want to capture here is uh, I want to bring back my D20 dice into the game because we can't be D20 studios without a dice roll. I love the idea of actually showing the roll as you enter rooms and then having that have some kind of meaning to it, um, and then having ways to kind of influence the dice as well. Um, so right now there's no control over the random, but imagine if like, you know, instead of it just sort of being monsters, you go into the room and it says. You enter the room, a, a darkly lit room. You hear sounds in the darkness. They haven't detected you yet. What do you do, right? And then there's some choices, like I want to go charge bull in there and just take him down or whatever it is. And then each of those options maybe has a dice roll attached to it, right? And it says, like, you have to roll a 14 or higher in a 20-sided dice. And so right up front, you have a risk. I have a, you know, 14 out of 20 chance of succeeding, um, if I fail, the consequence is the enemy will get extra attacks or whatever it is. But if I win, I get to edge my way ahead. So there's a little bit of like this kind of risk reward assessment going on. And then to further that, I, I imagine the idea that as you get uh, like additional power ups and find treasures, you can use those abilities to kind of weigh the dice in your favor. Uh, for example, if you were having to roll to like whether you could influence somebody to not attack you, um, maybe if you've got like the influencer power, you get plus five on that roll to increase your chances. So you, you have a better skill at succeeding than say somebody who does not have the persuasion skill. And that's that's one of the ways that I think that would be fun to kind of control the the randomness in the game. Still waiting to see that necromancer. There we go. Okay, so she spawned that time. So this time it looks like she spawned with a full cohort of five skeletons. We got four warriors, one archer, 
And what was her weird equipment she got? It looks like she has a bow and arrow. <laughs> so there you go. There's a really weird encounter that was just for test purposes. A frozen summoner that starts off with a bow and arrow. Just totally weird um, combination there. And oh, and she has two spells. How did she get the flesh golem? I don't know how she got flesh golem. That does that was not one of her card choices. So um, I'm gonna have to investigate that because I honestly don't know how she was able to draw that card. <laughs> That's kind of weird. Um, maybe I took a look at that encounter. Did I? Did I give her? Oh, bugs, go away. Huh. I have no idea how she was able to draw a. How she was able to draw <laughs> a flesh golem. That, oh, 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 oh. I see how she did it. Okay. I, I forgot about this. It looks like it is not using the card's power. It's using the deck here. I, I, it looks like when you explicitly pick a deck, it pulls from that deck. And so she picks two cards out of the skeleton deck. And I think I have that defined somewhere else. So there you go with that. Um, yeah. So there's an example of procedurally generated combat encounters. What do you guys think of that? Any comments or questions or things I can answer about that process and how that's working out so far? These are sort of the ingredients to the single player. It's not quite an experience yet, but we're getting the ingredients in place to create this experience. All quiet on the chat. Am I still streaming? I am. I see you guys are still here. Okay. So yeah. Um, anyway, so that's kind of some of the in-game in tool stuff. I'll kind of show you next uh, where my current goal sets are into, into getting this into your hands as quickly as possible. Um, so I'm going to close down my editor, and I am going to fire up the uh, current build of the game. And uh, Clever says, looks like there's lots of room to add tiny bits to each part of the system. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is where I'm going to be asking you guys lots of questions because, uh, again, you guys are going to have better ideas than me in terms of how to optimize this to the to the true experience you want. So, um, my first goal for this for the next release is to create a really simple version of our single player that will enable you to sort of experience the um, um, the first pass at creating a procedurally generated world and surviving through it. And Scribe asks, when will we be able to uh, play test this? Um, I'm hoping soon. Um, I'll, I'll kind of talk through my, my goals. And I, I think really it's just about getting to the first, what I would consider the first MVP. So I'm going to kind of share what that MVP looks like uh, really quick. Um, so just, just the other day I was working on this and I went and changed the campaign. So instead of seeing that initial map, I created the first... Uh, you know, prophecy map, I just kind of threw it in there. And what I did was enable you the ability to play through this and also um, generate new maps. So this this basically resets your progress and it starts a new adventure over and generates a, a new thing. Um, this has all, all got to be tuned. This is not like a necessarily good playable pass yet. It's just sort of an in-game test to make sure the system works and that it saves your progress. So like some of the things I had to get working first were like, if I leave the game and come back, it doesn't re-roll the map. You, obviously, you want to keep your progress as you go through. Um, but I'll give a quick example. So this particular map, um, this is the Spider Cave. So this is a, a test of a hard-coded adventure versus a procedural. I think this is that procedural dungeon we just played through. Um, but the way the current build works is that um, you pick your party at the campsite. So you get to actually build your deck in advance and pick your team. Um, so this would not be an example of the... Um, like starting from scratch, leveling up your character. This is more of a, uh, um, I guess, a survival mode, if you will. A, you already have a deck. You're going to try and survive through the single player campaign with your current team. That's how I would describe the first MVP. Because um, it's just a good way to kind of like test the connected levels and see how the play experience feels um, going through as a series of campaigns. But I'll give a quick example. We're going to play this Spider Cave mission. Um, and I'll kind of show you how the progression actually looks in the game. So I've spawned this dungeon. Again, not a whole lot of thought of design or atmosphere put into this. This is literally just a battle I have. It's a pitch battle, and you're fighting these these mutants uh, or this bug guy. But I'm gonna put my cheat codes on again just so I can kind of showcase this a little better. Um, I don't want to spend too much time. So much, oh, and that's way too loud. I'm so sorry about that. Um, let's crank this way down. Okay, I think that's right. For that. Sorry about the volume. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and kill this guy here. And Clever says, I hope you eventually have an unfair infinite mode that just keeps scaling until you die. See how long you can last. Oh, 
Uh, hands down, absolutely. That is that is that would be a fantastic thing to do. Yeah, because bragging rights for survival is is definitely an awesome game type. Um, okay, so I just beat this level. So right now, what happens is you beat this, you go back to the campsite. I already don't like this experience because it kind of disconnects you from the whole campaign. Um, but what I have got working so far is, hey, look at that! I completed something, and now I've got a you know it's it's green. Um, so this is my attempt at um, something here. This you're gonna see is kind of weird, but this is a camp, and I thought it'd be good to have rest points where you can replenish your characters, cards, and decks. So this particular mission is not really a battle. You just sort of appear at this campfire site, and now it says, "Hey, you discover a campsite, and decide to rest. This recovers all discarded cards from your deck." So if I had burned through all my cards, I could use the campsite and now get all my cards back into my deck. So it's sort of like a recovery option. Um, so just kind of switching up the combat and giving a chance to do a rest thing. Uh, but now I can leave and go to the next level. And I'm just going to kind of show you really quick how that looks with the game. Again, it goes back to the loading sequence. So I kind of got to figure out a better flow for this. Um, ideally, I feel like I'd wanted to maintain this screen here, then maybe show an animation. Um, but already you can see something has happened here. And what's happened is, um, my the, the the paths I did not pick are grayed out, and the path I, <clears throat> the path I did pick is now highlighted green, indicating this is the sort of the path I chose. And then the possible paths I can go on next are now pulsing, and I can choose amongst these different options. So I've got initially I had three choices, and they all ended at the campsite, and now I've got what five choices, and I can pick which one I want to go to. And so these are all different adventures. This one looks like it's the fall scene. Uh, this one's uh, the Withered Village. We'll go fight the Withereds. And so I can pick my path. And those will, of course, determine which paths I go into next map with. Okay, so this is like uh, this is like the pitch battle. This was actually one of the, the scenes in the trailer where these guys come and attack you. Those are the, the Withereds. We're just going to completely slaughter them all unfairly. Give them no chance to attack. Just to show you the flow. Okay, and then you'll come back and you're going to see that the next path is now completed. And what's important about this is that um, in addition to the progress of the map carrying over, the other piece that's carrying over is any type of cards I used, any health changes to my characters, any new abilities I have earned, they also carry over level to level as I play. So again, that resource management doesn't just apply to the current battle, but it applies to the entire meta of the map. Okay, so again, my idea is that, you know, we want to create obviously a much better UI here and we want to be able to have the um, these little nodes surface like more valuable information. Like maybe it'll tell you the types of monsters that inhabit this part of the world. Maybe it'll tell you about a treasure that may be rumored to be at this location. You know, any bits of information that would help you make a meaningful choice about which path you want to be able to take is really what's missing from this experience so far. All right, Scribe says, you may want to record a particular procedural map sequence for ghost replays. See how you fare versus your previous team, your former deck, a friend, the average player, etc. And then Clever says, I like the idea. Replay a seed to see if you could do better. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, the game actually supports seeded random. So that's that's another great idea. Maybe what I should do here is um, um, I'll add that to my list. Um, so I'll kind of give you guys an experience of what this looks like here. I'm going to switch out of this now and go to my... Um, my notepad. I'll give you a little insight into my development process. Whenever I start a project like this, I kind of start with like a, um, a high level to do where I sort of try to ground myself in a very concrete objective. Um, and I do this mainly to try and discipline myself because I get very sidetracked. I'll get excited about a tangent and go off on a tangent. And then it'll be weeks and weeks and weeks before you guys ever get a release. And I'm sorry about that. That's just sort of the, my weakness as a developer that I try to overcome. I'm, I'm very much a like, oh, this is cool. I want to finish it. Um, but the better way to approach things is like the, the scrum approach. Um, you pick a pick an objective and you make a sprint toward that and you focus everything on getting toward that particular release so that I can then get it in your hands and then you as the players have a chance to actually play it and provide real meaningful feedback on what you experience so that the next iteration is even better. And then, you know, we keep doing that over and over and over, adding things to it, tuning it until the experience is like just 
polish like a diamond, right? Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and add that list to my things to do. Um, so scribe suggests um, include option to provide the seed for random so that you can replay a particular configuration of map. Absolutely, that's a good call. Um, yeah, so the, the only, I, I thought a lot about the seeds. That's a great call. Um, I can imagine just you put in the, it gives you a number for your map and then you can replay that number. What I wonder about is as I add content, I, I don't have a lot of experience with procedural yet. Um, but I, I do recognize that if I add new content to the game, as I add contents, those seeds will take on different meanings because the tables on which they roll will change. So the only concern I would say with seeds is that they'll work, they'll always work for the particular release, but as soon as new content is added, um, unless I have a way to like control which parameters that seed is generated from, any changes to the content will of course affect the algorithm that the seed is used to make. So just, just something to keep in mind. Yeah, Clever says every addition will break all the old seeds. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's one of the concerns I have is I'm not sure how to maintain a seed for longevity. I'm I'm pretty sure that it, it will necessarily break the the old. Storing old versions of the algorithm is hard. Absolutely, but I I do like that idea and that's great for testing to make sure that there's not uh, players don't encounter unbeatable versions of the map and so forth. But uh, yeah, so that is a high level look at uh, our single player. Um, and some of the pieces that I've completed already, um, I, I've already in my list, I've got things I put to worry about later. Um, rewards, obviously a big part of playing the campaign is gonna be getting rewards. So if you're familiar with our current uh, single player tutorial, one of the standout elements is that after each mission, you get to pick a card and then add it to your deck. And that's sort of how the deck building process is integrated with the single player. So that's something that will be part of the procedural as well. Choosing your cards, um, getting power up. So I love the idea that, um, the encounters will get progressively harder and to help you survive you're going to find treasures equipment and abilities that will permanently power up your characters with new abilities so that you get stronger as you play right there's a feeling of progression that's happening with it to make it feel more like an rpg so that's those are all things that will come later with it uh, but yeah um so to summarize again my first objective for a first playable of this i guess would be to integrate a 10 tier procedural prophecy map that you can play indefinitely. Um, it'll focus primarily on survival mode, um, mainly because I have not yet figured out how players will pick their starting characters. So like for a normal run, I would imagine you starting with a much, much weaker version of a summoner, kind of like in the current tutorial, where you start off with a low level Sylvia the Druid who hasn't quite got her powers yet. And so part of the fun of the survival is you know, customizing her as you go in your own way, you know, leveling up her stats, getting her equipment, things like that. Um, but for this first iteration, I think it'd be cool just to let you create your own custom deck, go through the gauntlet, so to speak, and just try to survive to the end. Maybe we put some bosses at the end. I'm not quite sure. Um, but that's our first goal objective. Um, I would like to get this out fairly soon. Um, you know, the next two to three weeks would be a great target objective. So, um, what I will do since our time on the stream is almost done is I will put up some questions for you guys um, on the forums and I'll surface them on the discords because there is a lot of things I have questions on, um, particularly about um, ideas you may have for how to, how to surface this kind of information. So you saw, for example, I've got these, I'll go back to this thing here. Our prophecy map has got these various nodes, but it's not, the cleanest depiction of what could be shown as far as communicating all the different things in the maps. Like, um, I, I don't know that these symbols are necessarily relevant. I, I kind of like the idea that maybe the map shows you a location and maybe some kind of symbols to show you what kind of monsters might live there or something like that. Um, and then when you click on it, obviously it's got to have the right bits of information so you can decide. So I've got all kinds of questions about how you would envision the information being communicated what the UI could look like. Um, another idea I had, instead of this being like a treasure map, maybe this represents like a loom. Um, like kind of think of like the idea of summoner's fate, right? The loom of fate, like um, the fates are weaving together your destiny. And this represents like almost like a, or like a star constellation, you know, another kind of idea that ties in the whole prophecy. Maybe these are star constellations and what you're doing as you pick your path is like sort of drawing your, your, your your destiny's path like your constellation is what this ultimately looks like when you're done 
and maybe particular combinations result in different rewards granted at the end. I don't, I don't know, but those are all just some ideas I'm throwing out there. Um, again, looking to get your guys' feedback on what you think could work in this sort of thing uh, now that you've kind of seen a little bit more information about how it's coming together. So, yeah, there is our first look at single player. And uh, once again, I appreciate you guys all being here with me on the stream today. It's always a pleasure to, to, to work with you guys on the streams, make this game better. And um, again, if you are new to the stream or coming here for the first time, uh, the game we're building here is called Summoner's Fate. Our website is uh, summonersfate.com. We have a pre-release currently available. So if you're interested in playtesting the current build, checking out our PVP, our player versus AI, you can pick up the build on our website and join us in our Discord, um, our forums, and again, here on Twitch, we do these streams weekly. I'm also looking at potentially adding another day to the stream, maybe in the evenings, so that some more folks have opportunities to join us as well. Yeah, thank you, Maltros. He says, good stream. And uh, Clever says he's very excited. And Clever says, this is the thing that happens in every generative game engine. Yes, absolutely. So again, thank you guys so much for joining me today. And I will see you again next week. And, and of course, anytime in the Discord. All right, have a good one, guys.